is Safrina Dia Dinding Tias. So you can call me Tias. Um, um, I'm the one of uh, committee in the, uh, this summer course. Mm -hmm. And uh, so today uh, I'm uh, as a moder uh, moderator, uh, like uh, before is Mr. Ronnie and uh, Ms. Uh, Rizvi. So today uh, I will uh, introduce uh, our lecture. Uh, the first lecture is uh, Dr. Asadatan Abdullah. So she already with uh, us. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Sasa. So we call Dr. Sasa. So Dr. Sasa is from our department. So uh, she from our department, Department of Aquatic Product Technology, Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science, uh, IPB University. So she uh, graduate uh, uh, doctoral from Germany and then the master from uh, uh, Indonesia from ITB and, uh, and the bachelor from uh, IPB University. So uh, her research interest is in uh, fish and uh, seafood authentication, biomolecular technique application, lipid molecular detection technique, development and seafood uh, based natural product, aquatic biomaterial material for bioprospecting and seafood enzyme. So in here, we uh, I put the research get uh, uh, Dr. Sasa. So, uh, if you need uh, some publication uh, publication from Dr. Sasa, so you can uh, see in her uh, research gate, and maybe you can discuss with her uh, uh, by uh, research gate. And uh, so, I think before yesterday, uh, I saw so many uh, uh, groups. Uh, take uh, the title, the topic about the, the report is about the mislabeling, so uh, or seafood fraud. So today, uh, Dr. Sasa will talk about uh, basically about the mislabeling and uh, about the seafood fraud. So maybe uh, for uh, I think uh, this is introduction from me. So. Uh, I will give uh, time for you, uh, Dr. Sasa, please, time is yours, so you can uh, start the lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Safrina. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you all for uh, having me here today, uh, this afternoon. Please let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, IPB University, especially Department of Aquatic Products Technology for having me today uh, to present my uh, lecture about authentication of uh, seafood product using DNA-based approach. So uh, this is a short CV of me. So I'm a native uh, from Bogor. This is my uh, Scopus ID and my Orchid ID. So you can uh, search for my uh, publications there. So as mentioned before, my uh, special research interest is about uh, seafood authentication, especially in DNA-based method. Uh, as we know, there are a lot of uh, method for seafood authentications. There are uh, DNA-based method, protein-based method, and the other method. But for me, uh, uh, my special interest is DNA-based method. So what is the overview of our lecture today? So at first, I will talk about uh, food uh, seafood fraud, uh, mislabeling, global report on seafood fraud, and then we will continue with uh, fish and uh, seafood authentication. It's about a DNA-based method, and uh, a little bit uh, discuss about uh, DNA and PCR uh, method. Also, our uh, recent method development and challenge. What we what we face the challenge in the uh, development of DNA-based method. And the last, uh, I will uh, close the lecture with uh, the topic of uh, DNA-based emerging method. So 
Let's see about the uh, food fraud and uh, food mislabeling. So first, uh, I would like to introduce to you all if there's someone who didn't notice about uh, this uh, issue. So we will uh, look uh, at the publications by the Guardian. It's uh, in 2013. It's begin in. It was begin in 2013 about the horse meat scandal. So it's. Uh, I think it's one of the uh, uh, break uh, about the horse meat. Uh, the Tesco burger here uh, has a horse meat in uh, their uh, burger. So they labeled the burger as a uh, beef, but it's contain a uh, horse meat. So this uh, was a big, I think, uh, one of a uh, big uh, food industry scandal in parts of uh, Europe. So. It was reported that uh, the DNA has been uh, discovered uh, in frozen beef burgers in several of Irish and uh, British supermarket. And uh, if we continue to our uh, topics today about uh, seafood fraud, uh, what is seafood fraud? Why it is important? So it, the term of uh, seafood fraud has been uh, reported in some of uh, mass media in around the world. First, you see here in uh, based on uh, networks of applied science, uh, seafood mislabeling has been a persistent problem in uh, our uh, in our world on, and in our uh, seafood industry. It's a persistent problem. And there's also a question uh, in a customer, is my fake is my fish uh, a fake or how to spot a seafood fraud and what to do if uh, we are suspicious to suspicious to our uh, seafood meal there's a publication and news uh, that uh, has been published you can uh, read the news uh, in the google and uh, the other you can see uh, about the fraud here uh, from a uh, National Geographic. So some of the seafood fraud could be uh, dangerous uh, for some reasons uh, because of uh, they're uh, related to uh, safety and also uh, the quality of the food. And uh, the other is the healthy of the oceans. Some of uh, the uh, food, the fish that has been uh, fraud is uh, come from uh, illegal, uh, unreported, unregulated uh, fishing. And how about in Indonesian perspective? Uh, okay, in Indonesian perspective, uh, it turns out that uh, seafood fraud issue has become uh, one of uh, our country a strategic issue here. Uh, from the Ministry of uh, Marine uh, Affairs, uh, they said that the seafood fraud has been uh, the strategic issue to uh, the country. Okay. So uh, here we will uh, talk about and discuss about the uh, recent publications of uh, Guardian. They did a meta-analysis, which is an interesting topic about uh, seafood fraud. Uh, they did a meta-analysis uh, into 90, I think it's 90,000 studies uh, around the world. And uh, they found that uh, the seafood fraud has been found in uh, widespread across the 44 studies in 90 products. Uh, here we see that uh, they did in uh, research in meta-analysis in some region to study it about uh, this uh, mislabeling rate. And here you see that in uh, the highest rate of mislabeling has been happened in uh, the US and the Canada, and then in uh, Europe, uh, that has been reported, and uh, also it happened in South uh, America and also in Asia. There's a lot of uh, new publications uh, appears uh, in uh, Asia and reported a lot of uh, mislabeling. We will uh, talk about this uh, later in, uh, in the detailed uh, method of the seafood fraud. And... Uh, here, the study, you can uh, read the seafood fraud and seafood uh, mislabeling in uh, the Guardian. They said that in 30 countries, they found that 36% uh, uh, of the seafood has been mislabeled. And uh, here's the country. Uh, 
uh, what is uh, interesting in the in this study so here they reported that uh, some uh, fish has been uh, replaced by uh, the other uh, species so it's I think it's uh, they they reported about uh, seafood uh, substitutions, jadi species uh, substitutions. So in some cases, a lesser valued uh, fish uh, is labeled with the name of more expensive one. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, grouper and uh, butterfish are uh, among the species that frequently mislabeled. Uh, while the other species such as uh, sole, uh, bluefin, uh, or yellowfin tuna uh, are also uh, frequently mislabeled. And there was a 50% chance of a customers who will uh, not get what they had ordered. So if you go to the restaurants, then a 50% chance you didn't, you didn't get what you have ordered. So this is a very important uh, study because uh, it's uh, becoming you know, very important to the customer about this uh, mislabeled seafood. Okay. Uh, here we will see about the complexity of uh, food supply chains, which is uh, very challenging in the industry uh, to find ways in a traceability system. We will see the correlations uh, between fish and seafood authentications with uh, global supply chains. So today, the seafood industry is truly global. You can see uh, the illustrations I have made here uh, about the uh, supply chains globally. So it, uh, the fishing could be everywhere uh, in the world, and then uh, it will go uh, into uh, the several countries and with uh, several uh, process. So it will uh, be uh, stopped in uh, seafood industry and then it will transport it to the market before it come to your uh, plate or your home. So the traceability from farm or from uh, fish uh, to fork to your plates, it is really important because it uh, contain the traceability uh, systems and also it related to the global uh, supply chains of fish and uh, of course this uh, if it's a supply the big supply chains will be uh, very complicated and also opaque uh, we continue uh, to the terminology of the food fraud here you see some of uh, terminology or you can see the definitions of food fraud uh, food fraud uh, you can see from spring and moyer but i will uh, underline the food fraud uh, described by the codex uh, alimentarius here so food fraud is a illegal deception for economic gain using food. So it's all types of fraud. Uh, all types of fraud, if it's related to deception for economic gain, it will be uh, defined as a food fraud. In long definitions, you can read here from uh, Codex, it's uh, encompassed deliberate and intent intentional substitution. So there is a intentional substitution, substitute the species, and also add, addition, tampering, you change the label or misrepresentation of food, and also the food ingredient or food packaging, it will be included in the food fraud. So uh, the source of definitions, you can read uh, the journal in Journal of Food Science, uh, and also some of the uh, publications uh, published by uh, Spink and um, Moyer, yeah, especially Spink. So, uh, in our uh, presentation slide, uh, you see the some example of international uh, food standard and regulations who address the risk of food fraud related to uh, food adulterations. First, there is a Codex Alimentarius, and then, other, and then uh, there is a US Pharmacopoeia and uh, ISO also has a technical committee on fraud countermeasures. Uh, 
the international focus of uh, this ISO is in uh, complement to the US focus on adulterations because some countries uh, has uh, made this uh, issue of food adulterations very important and strategic issue. And in Asia, there is uh, also uh, regulations. Uh, I uh, took uh, two example of uh, regulations. It's one from Japan and the other from uh, South Korea. From Japan, there is a uh, Food Labeling Act in 2013 uh, for the reg to regulate the food labeling uh, and the principle of securing the safety and opportunity. And also in uh, South Korea, there is an, also an article uh, 13 uh, that uh, prohibits uh, for the false or unrealistic labeling of food. So there is a, there are uh, so much regulations in the world that uh, now uh, address the risk of fraud uh, related to uh, food adulterations. So it's uh, this. Uh, Seafood fraud and species uh, substitutions is uh, occurs uh, regularly in cheating the consumer out first, and then also it uh, can put the public health and the ocean's health at risk. Now we are in the uh, big questions. Why uh, seafood fraud and how did it happen? So mislabeling of fish or seafood fraud, it uh, occurs uh, in uh, different reasons. At first, it's because of fish is actually, fish is actually the most traded food commodities worldwide. So it is one of the most traded food commodities worldwide, uh, fish and seafood. So of course, if it uh, traded uh, around the world, it will through the complex uh, supply chains. As we see in the previous slides, the seafood and uh, fish has been uh, through the complex uh, supply chains. And this uh, mislabeling act could happen in intentionally or unintentionally uh, during uh, the trading uh, system. And it also happened because uh, sometimes uh, the feasibility of the fish species is similar between fish species. It has the same red colors or it's the, the body shape is the same between one fish to the other fish. So it could make a change to some people to replace what is the highest uh, economical value species with the lesser uh, value of uh, fish species. There, so you see now there's a, a change or uh, some uh, lack of the system which make uh, mislabeling could occur. And also there's the other reasons because uh, not every countries have their official species list name. So the name of the fish species is different uh, cross country. So there is no uh, uh, species uh, or seafood list, uh, which is uh, occurs, uh, have the similar name between countries. For example, uh, I will give you an example of red snapper. So red snapper, uh, if uh, there is a fish, uh, labeled as a red snapper, it must be the species of Lutjanus argentimaculatus. But the, that's only happen uh, in the FDA list. And if you uh, receive uh, some sample from the other countries, they labeled red snapper, but it may be uh, not uh, Lutjanus argentimaculatus. So in red snapper, maybe, maybe it will be Lutjanus malabaricus or Lutjanus erythropterus. And uh, sometimes also pinjol species, it label as a red snapper. And the worst case, it will be uh, the other fish not uh, belong to the uh, snapper family. For example, it's uh, become, uh, it is now uh, sometimes uh, for the red snapper, it uh, become uh, replaced by the red tilapia. Okay, so this uh, because of, uh, the local name or the market names uh, across country, it may contain a range of species name. It's very around the world. So 
this is the problem, first problem, why uh, the seafood fraud or seafood mislabeling could happen. Okay, so if we look further to the process uh, seafood or processed food, so seafood fraud, how did it happen in our food? Now, we can you see in my slide, there's a, in the left, there is a, a fillet uh, of white fish and maybe you suspect it is salmon, but you don't uh, really uh, assure about the species name if you see only the uh, fillet like uh, here, uh, you see in the left uh, of my slide. And then um, the other case, if it becomes a uh, better and fried uh, seafood like uh, this, uh, you see in um, uh, fish and chip uh, like this, you don't know what you have in your plate or in your, what is your fish product? What is it? Is it a species of cod? Is it a species of uh, basa? Is it a species of uh, catfish? What is it? Is it tilapia? We don't know because it uh, has, uh, it, uh, the product has been uh, removed uh, all the morphological characteristic uh, during the processing uh, system. And in the fishbowl like this, you don't know what is it. And uh, also, uh, it happens in the shark fin uh, industry. Uh, you don't know is it come from uh, the fin come from uh, the endangered species or it's come from uh, the other species. So in some cases, maybe the fish uh, has been mistakenly identified. Uh, because uh, the flesh has a similar physical quality. It has the similar color, it has the similar textures. So um, when it comes to uh, marketing of fresh fish, then uh, some uh, grocery store will uh, label all fish is with the label of uh, the name of species which are, has been famous for the customers. So the customers or uh, all the seafood consumers only know about snapper, sea bass, flatfish, cod. They don't know about the other name of species. So because of that, there's uh, a lot of change of this uh, fraud and mislabeling could happen. Okay. And now um, we will uh, continue to the consequences of uh, seafood fraud. So how about uh, if we talk about fish and seafood authentication? First, uh, in our mind, we should know that consumer uh, has the right to know about the label or the information when they buy a food. So the consumers need clear and accurate information and must be well informed about the foods they choose to buy because these uh, choices is sometimes related to their lifestyle. So they uh, also they health concerns, uh, for example, uh, seafood, uh, for, in, for example, of their uh, allergy uh, history or allergy background, because you maybe you know that uh, some people uh, may allergy to some species, but uh, doesn't uh, occur to have an allergic to the other uh, species. So, it is very important to be well informed about the fish species in the label of the packaging of the food that you buy. And uh, beside the allergenic uh, concerns, that there's also a concern about toxins uh, because some fish uh, may contain toxins. For example, in uh, during some uh, sometimes there is a, a fish that uh, contain um chiguatera toxins so it's uh, in uh, so some species may not be allowed to sold in the market if they caught during the, se the seasons of uh, chiguatera and also it's related to the religious practices because not every religion um, give permissions to eat all of a fish species some some uh, fish and selfish are uh, prohibit to eat by uh, some of uh, religious uh, practices. So it's uh, very important because it's, it's the consequences of the uh, face of uh, seafood fraud. Uh, 
Therefore, uh, the food labeling must be honest, must be accurate, and particularly the food that has been processed and it lost um, um, most of all uh, physical properties. So you cannot differentiate or you cannot uh, identify what species is this because it's already through the processing uh, of the uh, seafood. And uh, the food labeling has been defined as a part of food standard legislations that set out a specific requirement for the labeling compositions and some uh, safety parameters for specific high value food materials. You can uh, read again and see about the new terminology of food labeling. And if we continue here, uh, we see the fish and seafood authentications will ensure the correct labeling of fisheries product and will provide a positive impact to food safety, sustainability, and reliable seafood traceability. So it's uh, connected between um, food safety, uh, sustainability, and reliable seafood traceability all are in one package. So it, uh, the fish and seafood authentications now become very important because it will assure the correct labeling of fisheries product. And um, as we mentioned and uh, I mentioned before, I explained before the main cause of seafood uh, mislabeling, misdescriptions, illegal substitutions might be intentional or unintentional because uh, some of morphological characteristic has been removed, or it seems uh, very similar between uh, species. And also it mainly driven by the economic benefits. So what is the conclusions of this and seafood authentications? It is crucial to establish a rapid and valid authentication method to prevent the health hazard, the economic fraud, and illegal trading of endangered fish species. Uh, okay. Now, if we talk about fish and seafood authentications, the main terms is about species identification. So what is species identifications cover here? So species identifications will cover a very uh, important issue such as uh, food fraud, food material substitutions, and in species identifications, you will know if it's the material of the food has been substituted, has been follow or has been through the fraud. Uh, and also uh, with species identifications, you will know that your uh, food or your uh, seafood uh, products contain endangered species. Yeah, it's very important species identifications for the protections of the endangered species and uh, for the lifestyle and religions and also for your health if it's contained allergy or toxins material. Okay. Now, if we talk about fish identification, so now we, uh, I hope you are uh, following. It's uh, if we talk about uh, fish and uh, seafood authentications, we will talk about fish, ident fish species identifications. In first, uh, if it's a whole fish, it is easy if you do or you did an uh, morphological based identification. So uh, morphological based identification is based on the shape uh, of the body of the fish, the color of the fish, the scales, the fins, the numbers of uh, the uh, the bones in the fish. It might be a key of identification if you use a morphological uh, characteristic. But there is an important note if you want to do a uh, morphological based identifications, it really uh, requires an expert for identifications because not everybody is an expert for morphological identification. Sometimes it, uh, for the expert, it gives a, a false uh, positive identifications. I also have an experience with the expert of morphological identification. When I was working with uh, rat snapper, so there is a miss uh, in uh, expert uh, judgment about this identification based on morphology. So I collect the sample. Uh, I have two different samples, but uh, the experts say it's one species. But after I did the DNA-based method, then I know 
that uh, the species is different. So sometimes uh, the expert uh, did mistake in morphological characteristic. It's really hard to do that. I think it's it's uh, need a lot of experience, need a lot of specimens, and it's only applicable to the whole and non-process of fish. Now, uh, we will move to our uh, main uh, discussion today about DNA-based approach for species identifications. Uh, because of uh, several reasons I've been explained earlier, so now we know that uh, we need a method that specific, sensitive, and reliable. A method to identify the species, but it is must be uh, specific, sensitive, and it must be reliable. Yes, you will know how about the reliable. Uh, what is the reliable meaning here? The reliable mean is that you won't have any false negative result. And uh, what is it? What's the method? The method uh, first uh, and uh, the first uh, choice is for using the genomic or DNA-based approach. What is included in the DNA-based approach? First is DNA sequencing. It's the widely uh, used method, uh, DNA sequencing. And also uh, some of the researchers uh, develop a method based on SNPs and uh, species-specific uh, PCR primers. Also, the emerging uh, science is using DNA hybridizations for the DNA-based approach. Uh, for the DNA-based approach, there are two critical points when you develop a new marker for this uh, DNA-based uh, approach. First, you must focus on their discriminatory powers, and two, there must be a method that reproducible. So if you develop a method that cannot be used by the other scientists in the other part or the, in the other laboratory, then it, it cannot be claimed as a, a good DNA-based method for species identifications. OK. Uh, DNA authentications uh, has a powerful, powerful ability to identify seafood product uh, compared uh, to the species indicated by the other uh, method. It will allow you to identify uh, species uh, that uh, has been uh, morphog morphologically trait removed and uh, species that has been processed. And it's uh, often the only way to verify uh, the seafood uh, species uh, in the products is by using the DNA-based method, okay? Um, before we talk uh, more about this uh, DNA-based method, uh, I would like to uh, give a short introduction into the DNA. Some of you may be uh, familiar with this uh, work with because uh, I think that uh, some of you uh, has been working with this uh, DNA. Uh, what is DNA? So the DNA is a molecule uh, that contains a genetic code. So it's a blueprint of a genetic codes in the organisms. Uh, this DNA is uh, occur in uh, animals, they are in plants, uh, archaea, and in bacteria. They, they all of the organism uh, contains uh, genetic material of uh, DNA in uh, in their body. So uh, DNA is uh, also uh, have uh, two uh, terminology, which is important. First is uh, you can read again it about the uh, coding uh, sequence and non-coding sequence. Uh, here you see um, from the cell, uh, the nucleus uh, organelle, nucleus organelle, it contain a chromosome inside the nucleus. So the DNA of nuclear gene is uh, inside the nucleus. Uh, the DNA uh, contain uh, four uh, bases. It's uh, very um, simple. It's only contain uh, four bases. It's uh, first uh, adenine, uh, thymine, it, and uh, guanine, and also cytosines. It's uh, 
the DNA is uh, only contained for bases that um, uh, repeat, repeat, repeat again in the genetic code. So it's uh, very easy, I think, to work with the DNA. And uh, what is inside the DNA and what is the difference between the DNA and the RNA? So uh, if you uh, know maybe uh, if uh, working with biomolecular, you can work with the DNA or you can work with the RNA. If you work with the DNA, you will have a double-stranded of uh, nucleic acid. And the ribonucleic acid or RNA, it only contains uh, one single-stranded, or it, of course, it's only contains single-stranded. And uh, the base is a little bit different with uh, the DNA. It, uh, the difference you see here, it's uh, in the DNA, there is a base of thymine, but in the RNA, it's contained uh, oral cell. And what is the correlations between this DNA and our DNA-based method? Uh, the DNA uh, you collected will be used as a um, material to do a PCR. So what is uh, amplifications uh, of the DNA or PCR? It is uh, come from the, the process uh, that happens uh, real times now in your body, there's a uh, replications of the DNA. So the DNA replications is happen real time in, in vivo in your body right now. And every time it needed, it will be replicate the DNA. And we can uh, copy this uh, process into the PCR system. And then we can uh, do uh, amplification to amplify, to make a lot of copies of the DNA of we target. So then we can use it for the species identifications method. Okay, so what is a PCR system? The concept of the PCR system is to do a DNA replications, but in vitro. So it do it in the microchip and help by the PCR machines. It's amplify, it makes, um, uh, it rapidly makes millions to billions uh, copies of the specific uh, DNA uh, target. And so it's allow the scientists uh, to, to, to make a lot of uh, study based on this uh, PCR system. So this you can see in the slide, uh, you can take only a small uh, portions of the uh, fields and then uh, you do uh, DNA isolations uh, with uh, several methods. And after that, you can um, amplify, you can make a million copies uh, with the algorithmic uh, cycle using uh, PCR. So a first uh, cycle is uh, contain the naturations, annealing, and also extensions. Uh, in the beginning of the PCR uh, process, uh, the double standard DNA uh, denatured into uh, two uh, single strand, uh, as uh, we say, it parent uh, sequence. And this parent strand uh, anneal with the primer that you have been designed, or you can uh, just uh, use the other scientist uh, primer. It's a primary uh, sequence. Uh, if uh, it happens in vivo, it will be an um, mRNA as a template. But in the uh, PCR system, uh, you need this uh, primer, this uh, short oligonucleotide, as a primary for the first uh, cycle of the uh, amplification process. And after the primers anneal to the uh, sequence, then uh, with uh, the specific enzyme of uh, DNA polymerase, it will extend um, the sequence from primers uh, by using the DNTPs in your master mix. And uh, you can now have uh, two uh, similar copies of the parent uh, sequence in the beginning. Now you have uh, two others, um, Space uh, to other uh, sequence, and uh, after it's continued to the other cycles, then you will have uh, two uh, uh, 
uh, logarithmic of uh, copies of the PCR product. So you can imagine uh, you can have a million copies of your targeted uh, sequence by using uh, PCR uh, applications. Um, I have a slide to show you about the evolutions of PCR machines. Um, here you see um, the first uh, machine is uh, from 1980s. Maybe some of you uh, already knew that uh, the PCR has, is invented by uh, Carrie Mullis. Uh, so uh, he, he got the Nobel uh, for this uh, inventory. So it invented in 90, I think it's 1983 uh, for the PCR machines. And it has been evolved uh, in uh, this past, uh, I think 30 to, uh, I think it's almost 40 years. It has been evolved. From this, you, you see uh, in the left, in 80s, it's a uh, very old machines. And in 90s, there is a, uh, there's also a uh, new uh, PCR machines that uh, has, uh, maybe it uh, contains uh, it more digital and it more not an really analog. And also in now, uh, here's uh, the machines I uh, usually use in the laboratory. It's a uh, Proflex from uh, Thermo uh, Fisher. It contains uh, three um, different blocks of a PCR machine. So uh, if uh, you have uh, three different target, you can run in one time using this uh, Proflex PCR system because it uh, has uh, three uh, different blocks. So it made your work more easier. And nowadays, um, I think uh, the most uh, famous uh, machine is real-time PCR machines. In this, uh, I saw you Quant Studio. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, um, <laughs> this is uh, because uh, the machines that I usually use in the laboratory it's uh, applied biosystems. So this is a uh, Quant Studio Five. Uh, we have this in our university, the Quant Studio. But uh, now we use this machine only for COVID nineteen detections. Uh, but uh, it's uh, already in the university and it used for uh, research, especially in um, animal uh, science, in animal and health science. Okay, so this real-time PCR is different with uh, conventional PCR. What is the difference? The difference is in real-time PCR, you do not need to do any further step after you did your PCR. Using this uh, real-time PCR method, you can have your result real-time and you can uh, follow the progress of your PCR. So if we have an experience in the laboratory, if uh, we did something wrong, then uh, we do not have to wait for three hours before we knew there is something wrong with our, our uh, work with PCR. With these uh, real-time uh, machines, we will know and uh, directly. Ah, oh, there's a problem with uh, our work. There is no amplification, so we should uh, stop the process and then uh, did repeat again and uh, our work in the laboratory. Uh, this is one of the advantage of using uh, the real-time PCR. The disadvantage is, I think, uh, for us here is. Uh, it's on me uh, based on my experience. For the consumable of this uh, real-time PCR is a little bit difficult to have. Uh, and now in the pandemic era, it's more difficult again to get the consumable because uh, we must compete with uh, the people who uh, work in the health laboratory to uh, detect the COVID-19 patients. So. But uh, this uh, machine is uh, really good to do a new and emerging uh, research in uh, seafood uh, authentication based on DNA-based method. Okay. Uh, after uh, we learn a little bit about the DNA and uh, also about the PCR system, 
Now uh, we will continue our talk and our uh, lecture to the mitochondrial DNA. Why uh, now we talk about the mitochondrial DNA? So the DNA uh, in the organisms, especially in fish, because fish is eukaryote, it contains uh, two types of the DNA. First is uh, nuclear nuclear uh, gene. It uh, contains the genetic material from the uh, nucleus, and then we have a mitochondrial DNA. So why is mitochondrial DNA is preferred uh, compared to nuclear genes if we talk about species identifications? Uh, the first reason is because uh, the mitochondrial DNA is contain multiple copies uh, uh, in the press in the cell. So it uh, multiple copies uh, present in the cell and uh, of course, it will increase the likelihood of the success uh, of your PCR work, uh, even if you only have a small amount of food samples. So if uh, you do not have any other uh, duplicate sample, or if it is very important sample, you, you, do, you do not have any, uh, any other uh, samples, uh, this uh, mitochondrial DNA is preferable uh, to the nuclear genes because it's uh, may contain a lot of copies, so you will have a likelihood, a higher uh, success rate uh, compared to if you use uh, nuclear genes. And if in uh, in terms of uh, species identifications, uh, the mitochondrial DNA uh, is uh, has a high mutation rate, uh, so it is very important because it's related to the uh, to the requirement I have mentioned before about the discriminatory, discriminatory power. So this, uh, this marker must have a discriminatory power. And uh, I think that mitochondrial DNA uh, has a, this uh, trait because it uh, contains a high mutation rate. Uh, however, uh, for you to be uh, careful uh, because of uh, in some um, species, in some individual, there are uh, recombinations that has been reported uh, for uh, mitochondria. So if there is a recombination, so you must be very careful if you choose uh, this mitochondrial DNA as a marker for species identifications. For example, it in, appears in human freshwater mussels and nematodes. So as uh, as far as I know, there is uh, for muscles, uh, you should use the other uh, marker as a, as a um, species identification marker. You cannot use uh, some of mitochondrial uh, marker. Okay. So mitochondrial DNA as species identifications is uh, has a unique uh, characteristics because uh, uh, it's only short and it's only uh, approximately 16 kb in length it's, it's i think it's short so now it's uh, this mitochondrial uh, dna for species identification is also famous for uh, mitogenomic uh, studies uh, mitochondrial genomes it's uh, and uh, encodings uh, certain uh, essential oxidative phosphorylation subunit protein and also it contains three subunit complex of uh, CO1 to CO3 and uh, seven of a uh, complex of uh, ND1 to 6 and the ND4L. And it contains one subunit complex of cytochrome B, which is also the famous marker for DNA-based method, cytochrome B and cytochrome oxidase 1. And it also encoding um, 12S and 16S rRNA, and one uh, non-coding region uh, as a DELUP region. So it's uh, the genome of mitochondrial. I have a map of a mitochondrial genome. Uh, here you see uh, what is inside the mitochondrial genome. So this part of uh, the mitochondrial genome uh, genetic information, you can use it uh, as a whole or as a fragment of this um, gene as your marker for species identifications. 
I will show you the three uh, marker that has been used extensively in the uh, species identifications. First is cytochrome B. Cytochrome B has been used uh, extensively around the world for species identifications. Maybe uh, the famous uh, primers is uh, these primers who designed by Wolf et al. in 2000s and uh, also uh, 16S rRNA. This uh, primer is used for selfies. It's uh, from uh, Kam Nam Tong et al. Uh, 2005 and Palumbi. It's used for uh, selfies. It's for brown. Uh, and SRIM uh, species identifications. Uh, the other species, uh, sorry, the other marker that uh, really uh, important and has been used extensively is CO1 marker. This uh, used as a DNA barcoding marker. So this CO1 uh, or DNA barcoding uh, contain uh, uh, primers uh, which are famous is uh, FIS uh, F1 and FIS uh, F2. It's designed by word, but it has been changed and revisit uh, during years uh, by a lot of scientists and uh, it's already upgraded into the other, uh, the other uh, primer which is famous uh, and it also has uh, been uh, did by the other scientists and they use a small, smaller fragment of this uh, CO1 as a DNA mini barcoding. Okay, so this is, uh, I think uh, I choose three of the most, uh, most used uh, of uh, marker around the world for the uh, species identifications. Okay, so if we talk about uh, DNA-based method, so mainly we will talk about polymerase chain reactions. In this uh, polymerase chain reactions or PCR, uh, there are uh, several uh, methods that uh, come from uh, PCR-based method. Uh, first, uh, you can see about the Sanger uh, sequencing or it's uh, also a species-specific uh, PCR. And uh, from PCR, also you can uh, did uh, PCR RFLP. Uh, nowadays, uh, for uh, PCR RFLP, you can use a machine called uh, a Kia Excel to make your work with PCR RFLP more easy. And uh, also, uh, common DNA based method for seafood authentications um, recently is about real time uh, PCR. And uh, some scientists did a microarrays for uh, DNA-based method in seafood authentications. Uh, before you did a PCR, you need to do one uh, step that uh, very, very important. It's DNA extractions or DNA isolations. In, uh, if you do not uh, work uh, or you do not extract the DNA in a high quality uh, product, may um, affect uh, or it may affect your uh, next uh, PCR step. So it's uh, very important to have a, a high quality, a high purity of the DNA uh, before you work with, uh, especially before you work with uh, Sanger sequencing and real-time PCR. Okay. Um, If uh, we uh, and we continue to uh, the topic that uh, maybe uh, all of you have been waiting, it's about the DNA barcoding. So the DNA barcoding is a method that uh, nowadays is um, associated with the DNA based method. So if uh, there is a people of there is a scientist talk about the species or seafood uh, authentication using the DNA. So then you will uh, have in mind that it must use uh, DNA barcoding. So the DNA barcoding uh, premise is uh, every uh, species has a unique barcode of sequence. Uh, it's uh, like uh, if you do uh, shopping in the supermarket, 
every uh, goods uh, or every stuff in the supermarket has a unique barcode if you want to pay uh, you want to pay for the uh, goods or uh, something in the supermarket so the premise of the DNA barcoding is uh, every uh, species has a unique uh, barcode or what is the barcode here is unique sequence it's uh, the premise of the DNA barcoding okay what we did in the DNA barcoding what would we do what should we do in the DNA barcoding if we talk about the DNA barcoding there is a some uh, steps uh, that you should uh, work uh, I have made uh, some um, summary of uh, working with the DNA barcoding here in the slide you see uh, you need uh, your uh, sample it's uh, it's not always a uh, um, flash like this a fish flash or fish fillet but it may be a fin or a clip or everything uh, but uh here for uh, our uh, topics today i would uh, show you an example of um a fillet so we need our fish fillet and we need to cut a small amount portions of this uh, fresh uh, into small portions it's around uh, 100 um into 150 um milligrams of uh, this uh these uh, fillets, uh, these muscles, fish muscles, and then we use it for uh, DNA isolations. I show you an example of uh, what we did in the laboratory. We use uh, chiagenes. Uh, we are not using only uh, chiagenes. We are also using from uh, Gen 8. We are using the other method that do not use any um, column. For example, we also using uh, CTAP method uh, for uh, DNA isolations and after you did the DNA isolations you can check the quality of your isolations process uh, using an uh, agarose gel or you can use another uh, equipment such as a nanodrop uh, nanospectrophotometer by using this nanodrop uh, nanospectrophotometer you can uh, determine the concentrations of the, the DNA and also uh, you will know uh, the purity of your uh, DNA. But you can also use uh, other um, equipment um, such as of, with uh, using a fluorometry. Uh, you can use it also by Hox test. I also use it for my uh, PhD work. And uh, after you did uh, DNA isolations, you continue to do uh, PCR work. So in uh, PCR work, you did uh, or you will do an amplification. In uh, it is a DNA amplifications uh, using uh, barcoding primers. So barcoding primers, it's a CO1, cytochrome B, 16S RNA, and everything. Okay. So after um, amplifications using uh, barcoding primers and you will uh, have a PCR products. To check the quality of the PCR product, you need to run the gel in uh, agarose gel uh, electrophoresis. You see in the right, I have a, a, an example of our uh, laboratory work of DNA amplifications. So after you have this uh, positive uh, result, you uh, already have your uh, PCR products. Now you can continue to do a Sanger sequencing. So Sanger sequencing, uh, you can uh, get your uh, sequence. Uh, I think it's uh, maybe some of uh, uh, the sequence is a fragment uh, DNA. So you have you will have a short fragments, and uh, you compare your uh, sequence uh, into database comparisons. There are uh, a lot of database uh, that has been uh, publicly available. First, you can use um, uh, NCBI or GeneBank. Uh, in terms of uh, cytochrome oxidase one, you can use uh, both database. 
and uh, also there are other of database that has been uh, proposed and publicly available by scientists around the world. Uh, it's also uh, from Europe, there's uh, another database and in I think there's also in, in Japan, but it's all are synchronized with uh, NCBI. Um, after you do a database comparisons, then you will have a species ID. This ID of the species is contained in information. What is the name of the species of your fish fillet? So this is uh, more or less the whole work of the DNA barcoding. If you did the DNA barcoding, this is what will you do. Uh, first, you uh, isolate the DNA and then you amplify the targeted gene. And after that, you do uh, sequencing using Sanger and you will have a species ID. Then it's the work that you can do in uh, one uh, into two days. Um, depends on what equipment you have in the laboratory. If you have a, a, your sequencer, um, I, I think we also have a AB sequencers in IPB. Uh, you can do it by yourself, but most of us uh, did uh, send the sample into the third party because <laughs> it uh, effectively it's cost effective. I mean, it's cost effective, so most of us uh, send the sequence to the third party because it's only for species identifications. It doesn't need any um, secret if uh, for the sequence, but. It will be different if you do a sequencing of your um, new uh, developed uh, gene or your new developed uh, plants uh, that uh, that will be uh, you should do your sequence by yourself. In the terms of uh, species identifications, it's easy. You just send the sample to the third party, and then they will uh, send you back the sequencing result. Uh, and uh, you uh, do blast or you did a search in uh, both to compare the ID of the species. Okay. So uh, we continue to the other uh, method because there are uh, there are a lot of methods that I will deliver today to you. After we talk about the main or the most important method, because it's uh, known by uh, all of the scientists around the world as uh, DNA barcoding, uh, we continue to the other method that also important in uh, terms of DNA-based method in species authentications. The method name is uh, PCR RFLP. It, in short, it's a restriction fragment length polymorphism. So it it based on um, to, uh, in two uh, ways. First, uh, it uh, depends on uh, your uh, variability in sequence, and you will depend on, and the second is it's depend on the choice of your restrictions endonucleases enzyme. Okay. Um, in this uh, PCR RFLP, it's a method that involves a DNA target amplification. So you need to do PCR first. It's you need to do the PCR first, and after you got your uh, PCR products, then you can continue to do this RFLP by digest the sequence using restriction endonucleases enzyme. For example, you can use ECO R1, and uh, the result of the digestion uh, is. Uh, some several cut uh, fragment or several fragment then then has been cut. It's uh, simple, and it could be visualized by gel electrophoresis. Uh, however, for you to be uh, concerned, it's a uh, PCR FLP demands previous knowledge of sequence information. So you need a standard here. So you need a reference uh, reference database. You must uh, collect a reference database. Uh, you that you assure that that is uh, the exact species for the PCR FLP. Um, okay, this is a. Uh, the explanations, the explanations of this RFLP method. So you have a PCR products and you uh, add 
uh, into the microchip the restriction enzyme you can uh, choose the restriction enzyme by mapping the restriction enzyme it's a uh, publicly available for the uh, software to uh, preferences of this uh, restriction enzyme so after uh, it cut uh, into several uh, fragments you can uh, visualize the result by using gel electrophoresis but nowadays you can use a uh, uh, kia excel so i'm sorry i, I cannot uh, show you today but maybe in the another um, um, opportunity i will uh, explain more about this uh, kia excel should we have a short break or we continue? Okay. Uh, we have, uh, after we talk about uh, most of uh, the method that has been used uh, widely, then uh, we will continue to what we have done in IPB University and what is our ongoing research. So uh, I have been working for 11 years with this uh, DNA-based method. Uh, in the beginnings, I worked with uh, Scombri Day uh, fish and their processed products. So basically, I use um, DNA-based method of DNA barcoding start from uh, 2010 until uh, 2014. And uh, no, I think it's uh, until 2020. In 10 years, I did a PCR sequencing and also I did an RFLP and I also did an SSCP for uh, especially for hybrid fish because it's uh, tricky. It's um, it is uh, I think it's tricky in hybrid fish. Uh, the example of hybrid fish is Clarias group. It uh, easy to hybridize between its um, uh, and it may produce a new uh, specimen with content a little bit different DNA. So it, it contains SNPs there. So the SNPs may affect your RFLP method, your SSAP method. So you need to make a standard, real standard, when you're using a hybrid phase. And for a Scombri Day group, it's a little bit problematic because Scombri Day is closely related species. So if you did uh, identification using uh, DNA barcoding only, sometimes it is uh, complicated because it turns back the species ID has been resulted into several species in the same percentage of ID. So it's um, tricky using um, uh, only DNA barcoding method. So you need to add uh, one or more other sequence, uh, no, one or more other uh, method to uh, identify uh, the tuna or the scombri day uh, group. Um, in 2020, we uh, did uh, mostly into uh, commercial process product using the mini DNA barcodings and uh, from 2018 until present, we work with uh, real-time PCR for uh, endangered species. And I did also one year work with a red snapper. And for the futures, we don't know. Who knows? So you can see what uh, I've been uh, work and publications in my Scopus ID. Uh, excuse me. Uh, here's uh, some example of uh, our publication. Uh, you see that uh, we use a uh, PCR-based analysis, DNA barcoding, and also character-based approach. 
uh, in this recent year, we did a lot of work of uh, shark uh, fisheries. Uh, as you know, that Indonesia is one of the biggest producers of shark um, around the world. And there is uh, eight of uh, the species that has been uh, regulated in trading for Indonesia. And in Indonesia, the shark products are generally traded uh, in a process uh, such as fillet, sun-dried, or broiled, or some of them has been uh, exported as a fin or a body part. So seafood mislabeling here um, can compromise the management of sustainable fisheries. And sometimes it also uh, treat uh, threaten our protected and endangered species. Uh, what have we done for molecular identification? The, uh, the other scientists has did a DNA barcoding from uh, 2015 here. They did the DNA barcoding. And we did a DNA mini barcodes in 2020. So this is a Precisely what we did and we developed in the laboratory. So we designed uh, primers after uh, we did a sample uh, collections and uh, we did uh, DNA isolation and purifications. So after uh, we have uh, primers that species specific for qPCR or probes, then we did uh, endpoint PCR, uh, DNA barcoding, mini DNA barcodes, uh, real-time PCR, and also we did an uh, NGS also, or high throughput sequencing. So uh, the goals of uh, this um, research project is to have a rapid, user-friendly, and sensitive method, then we will have a best and reliable method. We uh, also included our uh, bioinformatic data analysis, uh, and it's I think for the high throughput sequencing, it's a massive genetic data analysis. So for the DNA isolation result, you see here that uh, I uh, have a different uh, pictures in the slide from fresh sample. You see it uh, has a strong band, and you can. Uh, use it uh, directly to the PCR system. But if you uh, isolate from the heavily processed sample, then you will have some uh, partially degraded or fragmented uh, DNA for the heavily processed sample. So from the DNA barcoding result, then uh, we found that if uh, we use a full-length DNA barcode, then some of them are not good. So we must continue with our mini DNA barcode. You see the differences between the two picture from full-length DNA barcode to the, the mini DNA barcodes. We have a, a very good result uh, when we are using this uh, mini DNA barcode, but some work with full DNA, full-length DNA barcode is not good. But this is need uh, replications in the laboratory. You, you cannot uh, generate the result uh, between the laboratory. It depends on the resource that you have in the laboratory. So DNA mini barcoding result, uh, we also develop a species specific uh, primers for Alpes pelagicus. This is a uh, three star shark and Tartarinus falciformis and Spinelle mini. The three of these species uh, has been uh, protected against uh, the law and also uh, threatened uh, species and vulnerable species. So we uh, develop a species specific primers for this. And what is the challenge uh, after that? The challenge is, of course, first is the mixed species. Uh, here's, uh, I will show you about this uh, mixed species. Uh, you see uh, in, the, in your uh, slides that uh, there are persons uh, identity that uh, have the same between Charcharinus falciformis and Isurus oxyrhynchus. So you cannot sure which, which is the species of my sample. Is it Charcharinus falciformis or it is Isurus oxyrhynchus? So this is the challenge of the DNA barcoding. So the full length uh, exhibit some weakness, 
uh, when you using it to the DNA degradations, and also it could affect the amplification of pulling CO1 barcode. Besides uh, the process of seafood, sometimes uh, contains various additives and preservatives, and that's very difficult to do the DNA extractions, and it reduces the DNA quality. That's uh, the challenge when you are using a popular method of DNA barcoding. But it uh, also that the conventional DNA barcoding is based on Sanger sequencing, which does not allow the sequencing of products that contain multiple species, as I saw you earlier in this picture. So if uh, our products contain of uh, multiple species, then it will back uh, the it will return the result uh, with the uh, confusing result like this. So it's uh, the challenge of uh, and uh, some disadvantage of using conventional DNA barcoding. Uh, we did also uh, develop a single plex and multiplex system for the real time PCR. You see that we already have developed a species specific primers uh, using three different um, DNA marker, uh, which I saw in the slide is a CO1 marker and a 12 sRNA. And it is a uh, shows a good result because it can differentiate between uh, spinalamini and the other uh, products or the other sample. So if you apply this to the uh, products of a processed product or fresh product, if it uh, does not contain any morphological trait, then you can easily uh, differentiate uh, by using these species-specific primers. And this uh, work or this uh, method uh, do not need any uh, further uh, electrophoresis or you don't need to do a single sequencing. It is an alternative to the single sequencing or a conventional DNA barcoding method. So we still in our uh, work to develop this multiplex system and it will be developed in the near future. Okay, uh, for the last part of my uh, talk, I will uh, show you the challenge and the emerging methods of this um, DNA-based method for seafood authentications. And uh, for uh, emerging method, there are a lot of, uh, maybe you have already known, it's a DNA, sorry, it's an, a first, it's isothermal amplifications and high throughput sequencing, also PCR ELISA, uh, droplet digital PCRs, and uh, high resolution melting. So it's uh, sometimes they call it as a closed tube DNA barcoding or whatever, but it's uh, exactly, it's high resolution uh, melting for the, the method, it's called high resolution melting. So it's analyze the melting um, curve of your uh, PCR uh, products. So this is uh, some of the emerging method. Okay. So first I will uh, describe about high throughput uh, sequencing. Okay, it's uh, a lot of long, long, very long history. Until now we are in 2021, we are working with uh, next generation sequencing. So it is based on the problem with uh, multiple species in one product or mixed species. So this one is uh, the result from a mixed species of uh, single sequencing. It's a bad uh, signal for the chromatogram. And after that, if you did a uh, blast uh, comparisons, then you will have a confusing result. This is why we should do uh, another and uh, should we develop another uh, method. We did try to do it by using high throughput sequencing. And uh, there's a benefit of uh, NGS uh, versus Sanger sequencing that you can read directly in the Illumina. I'm sorry because uh, I'm using Illumina here, but you can use another uh, products such as PacBio or uh, Pyro sequence, or, or maybe you can use from Roche. But um, with this uh, Illumina MySec, uh, there is the advantage of using this NGS method compared to the single sequencing. Um, 
so this is the workflow for the um, uh, my sec Illumina. You see that uh, it's from uh, preparations. It's all directly uh, doing uh, sequencing. So you are PCR free. It's uh, a little bit uh, relief because you don't need to do a PCR. Uh, this uh, if you did a whole genome sequencing, I mean, and then uh, you analyze uh, the result. Uh, it takes uh, not only a few hours for uh, our experience, it, you will need uh, an extensive and massive uh, DNA bioinformatic uh, work. You need a highly qualified uh, system. For example, you need a, a high memory of computer. You can uh, solve these problems also by using cloud computing. Uh, but you, you must uh, have a, have to pay something to uh, for the cloud computing. So when to use uh, NGS uh, compared to Sanger sequencing, you can read uh, directly also from uh, Illumina uh, websites. Yes, uh, it's a good choice. If you did a lot of work uh, of uh, sequencing, then it will be cost effective for using uh, NGS uh, compared to Sanger. And it's uh, allow you to uh, screen uh, multiple variant. Okay. So this is what uh, we will develop in the near future. We will try to uh, develop a pipeline work for this Minayan nanopore sequencing. This is an example of publications, uh, recent publications from Ho et al. It showed the feasibility of Minayan targeting the full length and short length CO1 uh, barcode to identify the ingredient of uh, seafood. Uh, so you see uh, they highlight the, uh, the publications. They develop a pipeline of working with uh, Minayans as seafood authentication tools that most of uh, they work with more than 100 seafood sample from Singapore and uh, the result here that uh, ingredient of the uh, seafood products some of them contain single species but uh, most of them are also contain multiple species so I think that they are uh, already successful to apply this uh, Minayan sequencer to uh, identify or to authenticate the uh, flatfish or uh, some of the squid ball and uh, crustaceans. Uh, the next uh, method uh, I would like to discuss today is about the LAMP or isothermal amplifications. I think this is a uh, also uh, emerging method and uh, it's promising to do it uh, in uh, field work. So I uh, personally will uh, develop and will apply this uh, method for, uh, for uh, on-field uh, work. If uh, I need to do an on-field uh, identification uh, <coughs> work, then uh, I will choose a isothermal amplifications because we only need a heating block and some of a micro pipette, of course, and uh, it's very easy, just need a timer for do uh, this method. So this is a stand for loop mediated isothermal amplifications and it developed by Notomi in 2000s. And it's very sensitive, easy, time efficient method. <clears throat> and it's uh, nowadays also uh, developed for COVID-19 detections because it's also easy. Uh, please uh, go for further reading in this uh, ICANN uh, genome site. It's uh, very detailed. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, underline that this uh, method needs uh, a lot of primers. It's only the disadvantage of this uh, method is they need a lot of primers. Uh, minimum, they need uh, four to six primers to have a very good result in uh, amplifications of uh, the DNA. Uh, it's uh, compared to the other method, for example, uh, for qPCR, it's uh, 45 to 120 minutes for the qPCR. 
uh, beside your preparation, it also takes sometimes to prepare the master mix into your uh, QPCR plate. And uh, for this uh, method, it uh, takes only uh, 60 minutes. Uh, it's uh, I think for my experience for differentiate uh, the uh, shark species, I only need um, 30 to 40 minutes for uh, uh, incubation time. So the method here is uh, you need the step is you need to do DNA extractions, of course. And after you did the DNA extraction here, they stayed about five minutes because there's a lot of uh, DNA uh, extraction kit that easier today. And it's only takes five minutes to have the DNA. And since it's not a sensitive method, so you can have a, a not really a high quality, not, not really pure but you need to have a very specific, specific uh, primer for the amplification with this ISO M uh, or isothermal DNA amplification. It takes only 30 to 60 minutes. And after that, you do a visualization. And with the current um, kits that come from, um, for example, from NAB, so you need a visualization. It's only by your eye, or you need um, a UV transluminator uh, to see uh, to visualize the result. This is uh, the example for the detections of atlantic cod using LMP. It's uh, like this. You can see uh, the result. You see with your eyes, or you see with a fluorescence with under UV light like this. You can differentiate. Uh, between the positive result and negative result only by their colors. So some of uh, okay, uh, the other emerging methods is uh, DNA uh, prop and hybridization. So this is uh, uh, mainly based on uh, the uh, separations of the hydrogen uh, bonds in the uh, DNA strand. So if you did the naturation, so by raising the pH and or temperatures, but uh, easier if you did uh, raising the temperature, so the double-stranded DNA will be single-stranded in a short time. But if you lower the temperature or you lower the, pH, the pH, then it will be uh, double-stranded again. So if we can separate this uh, double-stranded, then we can manipulate the DNA and use this technique to make a uh, a uh, method called DNA microarray. So DNA microarray, known as a DNA chip or lab on a chip, it's a collection of microscopic uh, DNA spot attached to a solid surface. You can use it to whatever solid surface. Uh, unfortunately, you need uh, for to make this uh, to make this uh, equipment. You need a, a complicated or sophisticated uh, equipment that we in now we don't have uh, this uh, robotic uh, or something machine like this in our university. But uh, this uh, method has been used by the other scientists. This one is uh, my colleague when I did my PhD. Uh, Christina has developed a, a user friendly and rapid uh, DNA microarray. Uh, essay for the authentications of 10 important fish species. What she did with what she and uh, her colleagues did is to target the species of Alaska pollock, cod, salmon, herring, and uh, also uh, tuna, sole, and malabar blood snapper. And this is what uh, she did. So uh, you see that uh, it's a microscopic uh, DNA uh, attached to a solid surface. Uh, so uh, they use a uh, Microchip, they uh, attach the spot of the ray, microarray, into the bottom of the microchip. So it's uh, easy. So you only just uh, to use this uh, method, you, you only use to, uh, or you only have to uh, add your uh, solution, so DNA extract solutions into the microchip. Then you, uh, you, have, you can read it on a uh, microchip some uh, reader for the microarray. 
So I think uh, I can conclude uh, my talk today. So the use of a suitable molecular marker is crucial for species identifications for both of a single and a multiple species samples. Uh, and successful amplifications of the DNA is depend mainly on your primer specificity, sensitivity, and also efficiency. It's very important. So ideally, you need to avoid and reduce the risk of false negative. It will be uh, uh, not good if you have a false negative result. Uh, my uh, grateful uh, goes to IPB University and our Ministry of Education, my beloved teacher, uh, Dr. Hartmut Rebain, and also my lecture partner, Dr. Mala Nuril Mala, Dr. Uh, Roni Nugraha, my colleagues in Advanced Research Laboratory, my uh, Shark Squad team, WCS, and my beloved students. Uh, this is some references, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Sasa, for a nice uh, topic. I think uh, uh, Dr. Sasa uh, already uh, sent to all you guys about the detail about the uh, authentication methods. I think this is based on the DNA. So because uh, I'm, uh, I'm and not focus in this field. So this is new, I think interesting because this is new information for me, uh, especially for me, because uh, my uh, research interest not in this field. So I think this is very interesting. So from the, I mean, the issue or the topic, so many people about uh, thinking about the mislabeling and then uh, Dr. Sasa already uh, uh, share, already uh, talk about more detail about the method and then a comparable, so many methods can uh, use for uh, detection, uh, especially uh, this is uh, for the uh, DNA-based uh, method. So now we let's ask for discussion. Maybe in here you have a question or someone uh, already researched in this field so we can uh, discuss. Uh, today with Dr. Sasa. So please, okay. Uh, we have a question. We have uh, someone asked in the chat box. And uh, maybe before I read uh, the question in the chat box, maybe if someone uh, want to uh, talk uh, directly to Dr. Sasa, please raise a hand and open your mic and you can uh, ask uh, her. If okay, uh, okay, maybe uh, first I will uh, read the question from Robert Rosebella Malo. I think this is from Philippines, right? So, uh, uh, is there any law in the mislabeling, and what are some of uh, the offenses? Yeah. The first question is, is there any law in the mislabeling and what are some of the off uh, offenses? So maybe one by one, Dr. Sasa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because we have three questions, so maybe better is one by one. So yeah, it's okay. more easy. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Safrina. And thank you uh, for your questions, uh, Rosbella. Uh, for in Indonesia, I think uh, for mislabeling, uh, we have uh, some uh, law, but uh, I don't know about the uh, the offenses uh, because it takes uh, not only uh, one uh, law, but it um, may be a lot of uh, law. But this is important because we are a country that exported our uh, fisheries product to the other country, so the uh, the country who uh, imported the fish and seafood product from our country need to assure uh, what uh, species is inside our uh, products. So they uh, already uh, what do we need uh, ratifications for the law for the European Union. Uh, I know exactly for the European Union they need to. Uh, they uh, they need us as a 
as a producer to uh, give a certifications of uh, species identifications using DNA-based method. So I think for uh, DNA barcoding is uh, preferable for this uh, method. Maybe that's, uh, I can uh, answer uh, your questions, Rosbella. Maybe any comment, Rosbella, for the answer from Dr. Sasa? If no, maybe we will we will move to the next question. I think the yes. next question from Kahmi from USM. So uh, the question is: May I know how to select and design a suitable primer? Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, to uh, design a suitable, uh, specific, and efficient primer you need to do uh, some steps. First, uh, you need to do a multiple uh, sequence alignment. Uh, oh no, you uh, it's uh, contain a lot of bioinformatic work. So first you need to retrieve a sequence and then you need to do a multiple sequence alignment using uh, some softwares that are available uh, publicly such as BioEdit or you can use uh, mega, mega softwares. And after you did a multiple sequence alignment, you can uh, determine which uh, region is uh, specific to your target genes. And after you decide uh, what uh, sequence or short uh, oligonucleotide between 20 to 25 uh, uh, nucleotides that uh, you think it will be uh, specific and uh, sensitive to the target sequence, then you uh, do a quality uh, check. The quality check of your uh, primer design, you can use a primer tree uh, software or you can use a blast also. Because it need uh, also uh, exercise, maybe I can suggest you to try to uh, open about a primer tree or NCBI. Okay, maybe this uh, suggestion from Dr. Sasa, you can uh, check and try it. <laughs> and maybe you can exercise from that. Uh, I think this is like software, right? Yes. Yeah. So maybe Kahmai can uh, uh, try and check first and try it. And maybe if you need some tutorial, I think in YouTube, maybe you can see or somewhere the tutorial, I mean, the guideline about that software, maybe you can find it in the internet. I think now it's easier all uh, about the guideline in the internet is easier to take it. So the next question is uh, from Joshua, I think because we still have, uh, I mean, uh, the time. So maybe from the Joshua, he asked about can LEMP decrease the species from different genus or family? Okay, uh, I will directly answer the questions from Joshua. Thank you for the questions. So isothermal amplifications using uh, LIMP can distinguish uh, the species from uh, different uh, genus or different family. But uh, I think the, the first and the most important um, requirement you need to have in mind is that uh, you must have a species-specific primer. It's You need to design a very good primer. So I think one of the disadvantage of using the LIMP or uh, isothermal amplification, you need to uh, invest your time, a lot of time, to design your primer. Because if you don't, do not have a, a very good primer, then you cannot uh, differentiate uh, between uh, species, genus, or family. I think that's the answer uh, for Joshua. Maybe any comment, Joshua, or I think enough. Maybe the next question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, Joshua, for the comment. So the next is from the Larsen from Uschi, UC, uh, yeah, from Malaysia. 
Uh, hi, Dr. Sasa. So as you say that micro, uh, mitochondrial DNA is preferred, but you said also that uh, mitochondrial DNA has a lot mutation. So is there any difficulties in the designing the primer? I think it's related with before I think about the primer. Yes, okay. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, Hassan, for the question. It's very good questions. I think I missed something when I explain about the mitochondrial uh, DNA. So the mutations is, uh, I think it's uh, it's not bad. It's a good uh, sign that in mitochondria has a lot of mutations uh, between species. So intraspecies variability is high. So to design a good uh, primer or marker, you need to select the region that can differentiate between uh, species. So uh, it must be it must uh, contain a high variability of uh, genetic information uh, between species. So a lot of mutations is good because uh, its mutations happens in the species. So between species A or species B, you can differentiate it easily when you using mitochondrial DNA. It's one of the uh, greatest advantage of using mitochondrial DNA. I hope it answer your questions, Larson. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And um, today we have so many questions, I think, as this is good. The good discussion is more interesting. So the next is uh, still the Robella, uh, Rosbella. So Rosbella, can we also determine sex of crabs, shrimp, and other seafood using PCR? Mm. Okay, Rosbella, it's a difficult question. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have any experience uh, to determine the sex of the species using uh, PCR because uh, the result that I've got is a sequence that uh, only contain the information about the species name compared to the database, of course. So uh, I don't, uh, I don't know about uh, it can determine the success of the species. I'm really sorry, but that's only uh, I can uh, answer now for the questions. Okay, maybe that's. Well, uh, I mean, we can thinking more. Maybe Dr. Yeah. Sasa will think more. I think the good question because maybe some field maybe need uh, like for indeed uh, taxonomy or something mm -hmm. need uh, that's information. I mean, the sex species is uh, important for uh, identification or taxonomies or something. And uh, related with the uh, the the data, I think, about uh, the comparable uh, uh, digital library and uh, uh, our result. Uh, 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 we have question for Anissa. I think Anissa from IPB. So she asked about how we get, I think this is more technical question, but it's okay because uh, mostly in here, uh, a bachelor student. So maybe uh, they, uh, they don't know about the technical uh, uh the technical how to like the uh, her question is how we get the list of species by dna barcoding species in the digital library so how we get the list species so and then is it just put our result of pcr into the website or we should compare it by our own self by see the dna result of every species and is there any possibility miss data or fake data to compare DNA barcoding species in the in digital library? I think this more, uh, yeah, technical. Okay, uh, thank you, Anissa, for your uh, good question. So first, for the uh, technical uh, work to uh, compare uh, our result to the database. Uh, uh, you need to have a sequence of your own. So the result of the PCR is only uh, solutions contain our PCR products. These solutions need to be sequenced by using uh, other equipment. It's a sequencer. Uh, the method called uh, Sanger sequencing. 
So using this uh, method, you can have a sequence of your own and the sequence of your own, your, your uh, private sequence, then you compare it, uh, copy your sequence, uh, your sequence, your sequence as it's, I think it's uh, 600 to 700 uh, best pairs and you com copy it to the uh, website of uh, NCBI for uh, blast uh, nucleotide. And then you choose BLAS and you will have a list of uh, prospective uh, species of your uh, samples. And for the second questions, for the false uh, result or false, I think, it, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's a possibility of missed data or fake data. Yes, it's uh, already discussed and already known by most of the scientists in uh, genomic that the data from the repository may contain uh, uh, not a correct uh, species identified label. So sometimes uh, it's uh, because it's repository, so you can, uh, everybody from around the world can uh, store their data in the repository. So if you do not do, you didn't do the correct uh, species identifications, for example, by using morphology or the DNA is uh, quality is not good, then you will have a false uh, positive result. Then it will uh, lead to the incorrect uh, label of the uh, sequence in the database. Uh, we have a, a lot of experience uh, of this uh, fake data, then uh, yes, we can know it, but uh, we cannot. Uh, you can uh, also read some publications uh, that uh, mentions about this, and they will show you which data is fake, which data is not correct. You can uh, use that uh, publications. I think. Okay, I think this is more specific. I think yeah, the the, the discussion yeah, uh, in uh, with the in the expertise field. So uh, the next, I think related with the method. So uh, Nur Ihya Iza asked about, uh, you explained uh, so many methods uh, about uh, before. So what the best method for seafood identification okay. and is method also have any deficiency? Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for your questions. Yes, uh, there, are, there are a lot of options if you want to do a species uh, identifications. So I think uh, if you are only to do, uh, if you know that your sample is fresh, it's not come from multiple spaces, then we still use DNA barcoding as a gold standard for species identifications. But if you have a suspicious uh, that your sample is multiple uh, species or mixed, then you could use the other method that I have mentioned before. I think uh, that's all I can answer for uh, Noor, Iza. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kasa. Yes. Okay, Noor, Iza. Okay, so uh, this is good question, I think, from Ranula. So how, uh, what, did, any tips about what should we consumer as the non-expert to the avoid seafood fraud as possible, <laughs> how we know. <laughs> okay. Or I, I think the, 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 the similar question from the Fajar, I think, mm -hmm. is uh, any producer by manufacturer is protected from food mislabeling. And yeah, maybe this is good question. I think, I mean, uh, from us, we are is uh, cons uh, consumer, right? So how we know? <laughs> This uh, our products maybe this mess labeling or no so any how to avoid or something. Mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I think for the mm, for non expert uh, we cannot do anything if we did. Uh, so or suspect uh, or we suspect something in the market even uh, for me it's difficult if uh, i've got a product in the market 
So you need to send the sample to the laboratory. <laughs> If you read about the the report from Oceana, it's uh, it's a NGO uh, from the United States. It, it's a big NGO who fight for the uh, seafood fraud. They also uh, suggest that if you suspect something, then you can send the sample to the laboratory. Maybe it's what we can do. <laughs> okay, so about the the, uh, I mean uh, the, the food in the canning food. I think uh, someone asked about the canning food. Can, uh, can food. Okay. Yeah. Uh, corn corn cornet beef considered as food fraud. So uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Teresa, yeah, ask about that. You can good like cornered beef considered as a uh, food fraud. Yes. Corn, uh, yeah, cornered. Corn, corn, cornered beef. Yeah. Uh, yeah. beef. Cornered beef. No, it's it's if it's uh, declared in the label, if it's uh, contain a uh, process uh, beef uh, meat, uh, and it's already mentioned, it's a cornered beef. So I think it's not a food fraud. But it uh, will be a food fraud if uh, they said it's cornered beef, but it contains a horse meat like that. <laughs> Then it will be fraud. Or it contains another uh, meat uh, besides beef or uh, cow's meat like that. Okay. I think about the dismiss labeling, uh, every uh, country I think have some regulation, right? To check it and uh, I mean, especially for export the product, I think like uh, from the China in Indonesia or something. So we need to check it and some, uh, we have some, what to say, we say ministry focus on this field. So uh, be, uh, like before Dr. Rina uh, in the first, uh, I mean the second lecture, I think uh, we have Dr. Rina. So she uh, is the, from the government who uh, work about the traceability and check it about the, uh, especially traceability about focus on the mislabeling, I think. So in our uh, country, we have some, uh, we have ministry, uh, especially some what we call <laughs> department or yeah, division in uh, ministry, fisheries ministry to fo focus on the, about check it, traceability about the mislabeling fraud, uh, fraud. Uh, to uh, avoid some uh, product, especially uh, like uh, uh, some uh, Mr. Solomon asking about uh, considering the large fact of mislabeling product in development country. So is this product being exported to developing country? And yeah, maybe usually uh, maybe some yeah different countries like place and especially like uh, the big uh, country like Indonesia and Philippines big country so many consuming in their cons uh, consumer in there so maybe this is a uh, mislabeling fraud is like focus and just like um, I want to say a uh, focus topic from uh, uh, our country to check it uh, the export uh, product I think So the last one, I think before we go to uh, the question and then we take a break before the second uh, second lecture from Professor Rati. So I uh, we have question. I think this question because I mean now you uh, you said about, you talk about like PCR and something and now uh, for, uh, uh, we uh, always hear about PCR from, because now is pandemic COVID. So, so many, uh, I mean, we if we want to check it, uh, uh, our uh, positive or no, we using the PCR. So in here, uh, we have uh, the question related. So from Joshua, Joshua asked, uh, my reverse uh, transcription polymers chain reaction, RT-PCR, is prefer over loop mediated in so amplific uh, amplification for COVID diagnostic? <laughs> Why okay. refer so? Why? <laughs> so uh, I will thank you for your question, Joshua. I will try to answer your questions to my knowledge that uh, COVID-19 is a RNA virus. So the genetic material is uh, RNA. So it's, it's uh, 
I think for the PCR, uh, it's uh, for the real time, uh, for the RNA, it's uh, easier to perform and maybe it, maybe it more accurate because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, for LAMP, you need uh, to design a very specific uh, primers and it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's a uh, different maybe uh, for the RNA uh, later Dr. Ronnie could answer uh, your questions better because he has a lot of experience uh, working with uh, RNA it's different with the DNA but for uh, COVID-19 diagnostic I think in Indonesia as I to my knowledge I knew that in uh, Bogor uh, there's uh, two types of uh, of uh, tests for COVID-19, there's uh, not only uh, using uh, real-time PCR, but we also use a uh, for saliva test. You, you can you are not uh, will be not swab, but you uh, give your saliva. It's uh, for the isothermal uh, test using the LAMP. There's also uh, another options for test. I think that's all I can answer. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe this is more like uh, Dr. Ronnie Peel, right? <laughs> Expertise. Yeah, for the RNA is uh, yeah, Dr. Ronnie. <laughs> okay, maybe the last question from Anissa. Sorry, Anissa, you from the uh, Untirta, right? Uh, University uh, uh, Tirta Yasa. So, uh, the Anissa, the last question from Anissa. I would like to ask, uh, how about the certified international labeling such as comes from Seafood Weight Watch program? It is suitable enough to prevent food fraud? Uh, yes, I think uh, you can read also the new report uh, or brief released by SGS. It's a, it's a, one of the biggest standardizations organizations, I think, for SGS. And they uh, also uh, have uh, mentions that, yeah, as we know, uh, the DNA-based method is, there are no uh, standardization of method. I think that also make it uh, very difficult for seafood authentications or seafood fraud to be diminished because we don't have any, uh, in, we are not in the same page. Every, everybody has uh, an options for the detections of the species. I think uh, for some uh, country it's enough, but for the other country, you need to do a DNA-based method. I think that's all. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, all question, maybe not all, but I think this, this question, discussion is, uh, very interesting and so many uh, thank you all for nice question and thank you Dr. Sasa for uh, the answering the all question from our uh, participant today so thank you for nice uh, talking today and uh, I think I hope you uh, lecture now uh, send us this the new information and new knowledge from you and Maybe in the future we will use that uh, the, the that uh, knowledge. I think. Thank you, Dr. Sasa. I think this the the the, the section the session the Dr. Sasa finished. Thank you, Dr. Sasa. And uh, as a usual, after the lecture we have the quiz from you all guys. So oh sorry. Uh, maybe before we uh, uh, before you do quiz. Maybe we uh, let's take a picture with Dr. Sasa. Please uh, open your uh, camera and the maybe the committee can take a picture. Dimas and Taufan, maybe. Already, mom. Okay. Okay, maybe from you, Dimas, if you are all already open camera and we can take a picture.
maybe Burisvi can help or yes uh, on Dimas Dimas can you lead the photo session uh, yes mom okay please sorry okay uh, uh, I, I I have a three screen in my laptop and I start with a screen one ready one two three say cheese okay uh, next uh, screen two okay uh, already one two three say cheese okay uh, the last one okay uh, already one two three Okay. Thank you, Mom. Thank you once again. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasa. Big applause for Dr. Sasa for nice uh, talking lecture today. So after this lecture, uh, thank you, Dr. As, as easily, so you should take uh, the quiz. Maybe uh, please uh, the committee share the link for the quiz. And then we will start again after uh, you take a quiz and we will start the second lecture from Professor Rati about the uh, non-thermal uh, processing uh, at the 3.20. So uh, please, uh, yeah, you can take a, a quiz and let's take a break. Thank you. See you in 320, right?
of beautifully arranged poems like a series of beautifully arranged poems the work of the creator let's start the journey to create moment that will never be forgotten of eternal enchantments and it's not just a dream come true but this beauty is a true story that will not be missed the land of brotherhood in a thick piece of diversity a legacy with the tenderness of inspiration an inheritance with characteristic strength that will never be found anywhere else. The aroma of Trutis. From the legacy of the archipelago, which will live longing when it fails on the tongue of true hunters deliciously. a trail on historic land, awakening the soul of adventure to the amazing nature, and admiration for the lovers. When talking about natural wonders and the culture of Bangka Bledung is the answer to quench the thirst for eternal beauty. your adventurous soul. Start your journey.
Assalamualaikum Prof. Rati. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, sebentar, saya belum bisa nyalain video. Oh iya, Bu. Jam berapa? Kita mulai sebentar dua menit lagi ya? Ya, betul, Bu. Dua menit lagi ya, Bu, ya? Alright, ya. ya. Terima kasih. Halo Ibu Rati, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining us in the summer course. 
You're welcome. Well, my pleasure. Okay, I'm kind of ready. So it's up to you whenever you feel like you're starting the class. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prabhati. Okay, uh, uh, participant, maybe we can start now, I think, because Prof. Rati uh, already here with us uh, for starting the uh, her lecture today. So uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for Professor Rati for coming in our uh, event, summer course. This is the, the third summer course uh, in our department. So, uh, but now this year, uh, the summer course is in online, but before we have the offline. So usually we have some, uh, what to say, uh, uh, event to go somewhere in the fisheries area. But because now it's pandemic, so we just uh, lecture about the lecture and the uh, online. But uh, the good news is the the participants. We have uh, so many participants uh, this year, so around one hundred thirty-five, I think, reads feet, right? So it is from uh, nine uh, nine uh, country, uh, seven country, I think. Nine. Nine, nine country. country. So Four I think continent. this is uh, a good opportunity, especially for our students to meet all people from uh, our uh, uh, different country. I think this is a good uh, opportunity. Okay, let's uh, meet to, uh, okay, okay. Let me to uh, start, introduce first uh, about the, our lecture today. So today we, in the second uh, session in today's, we have the Professor uh, Rati. So I will uh, share about, sorry, uh, share about her profile. So maybe, I just pick up a professor from the uh, uh, website, I think here. It's okay. <laughs> so I'll introduce first. So uh, this is uh, our lecture now is Professor uh, Rati Dewanti Haryadi. So maybe we call Professor Rati. And uh, Professor Rati from Department Food Science and Technology, Faculty Agricultural Technology, IPB University. So her expertise is in the food microbiology. So, uh, and then now uh, she will, uh, the topic lecture today is about the non-thermal methods for answering microbial, uh, sorry, but, uh, microbiological quality and safe uh, seafood. I think this is uh, for me introduction about her. So I think before I, uh, I just take your course in when I'm bachelor, I think, in the high TV. So okay. uh, uh, nice to meet you again, uh, Professor Rati. Uh, and please uh, uh, take your time to uh, this lecture. Great. Maybe I will stop. OK, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, everyone in Indonesia, but maybe good day or good morning for anyone elsewhere. Uh, I think first I'd like to thank the organizer to have me here. I'd like, uh, I'm very honored to participate in this summer course. And uh, as mentioned uh, before, I will be uh, giving lecture on non-thermal approaches for uh, ensuring microbiological uh, quality and safety. I'm a microbiologist, so I'm not a uh, food engineer. So uh, what I'm going to uh, look at this technology is in the point of view of microbiologist. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Ibu Safrina, and then also Marisvi that has been uh, very kind in connecting me with this event. Uh, I would like to uh, share my um, PowerPoint. Hold on a second. Okay. Can anybody see the? Can people see my PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So I will put it in a slideshow and this is the title of the talk. I don't have to introduce myself, I believe, because uh, I've been introduced before. So you can see my credential here and my education prior to meeting you. It was just long, long time ago. And I will start by outlining what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. That is about just introduction about seafood. I know you probably, most of you are students in fishery that's that know who knows better about seafood than me. And then what are uh, commonly found microorganisms in seafood that usually cause spoilage as well as uh, foodborne disease problems. And then I will talk about the general control that has been uh, in place for controlling microbial contamination in seafoods. And I will then talk about some selected non-thermal approaches. There are plenty of them. I don't, won't have time to talk about it. So I picked radiation, hydrostatic pressure processing, or sometimes people call it high hydrostatic pressure, uh, processing or pressure, which is weird. Sometimes it's HHP, but sometimes it's HPP, but they all mean the same thing. And then we talk about a little bit about the pulsed electric field and then the use of natural preservatives as well as biopreservation. So I would like to limit the discussion to that five uh, non-thermal approach. So I would like to start. So as you all know, uh, seafood cover various uh, group of uh, commodity. The first one is the fish, both uh, seawater and fresh water, and then also crustaceans, shrimp, crab, and all of this fancy stuff, mollusk, or mussels, scallops, cockles, you name it, uh, I probably don't know most of them. Okay, and then the respective aquaculture species. Indonesia uh, is, uh, in Indonesia, seafood is very important. It's contribute to the economy. We know that um, the value of export in 2018 reached approximately 3.5 billion US dollars. It is, they are also very good source of protein that contributes to people's uh, well-being. However, they are highly perishable. It spoils easily. Uh, you can't just leave your seafood at room temperature for a long time. And then uh, it, costs, it has caused foodborne illnesses and it has cost us uh, economy that is uh, due to export rejection. I'm, sure you can find all of the data about it. I'm not going to present those data today. So the reason why they are uh, highly perishable is because even though the muscular tissue of the fresh caught fish is normally sterile, however, the skin, which is always in contact with the environment, is usually contaminated by bacteria or other microorganisms. Uh, skin is usually less than gills and gut. But, but you can see the uh, load of the microorganism is in the range of 100 to 100, uh, 10 million in skin. And then a uh, gut is from 1,000 to about 1 billion. The main microflora are gram-negative uh, spoilage bacteria. And similarly, actually, you can find it in the mollusk. But the mollusk spoilage is usually uh, glycolytic because uh, of the glycogen uh, content of the mollusk. And when the pH decrease to about 5.8, then not only the gram-negative uh, bacteria, but also enterococci, lactobacilli, and even yeast will dominate the later uh, stages of the spoilage. Crustaceans uh, usually have a, uh, experience more rapid microbiological spoilage due to both microflora and also contamination from the mud, uh, uh, following uh, trawling, for example. And the higher amount of free amino acid and other soluble uh, nitrogen compound usually can result in higher level of uh, total volatile basic nitrogen. So it spoils a bit more easily. In addition to spoilage, this microorganism, which sometimes naturally occurring, but also sometimes coming from the environment, can also cause illnesses in human. The earliest report of the shellfish transmitted diseases were documented early, uh, earlier, a lot earlier in the late of 19th and early 20th century, uh, usually due to sewage uh, treatment or on 
or unavailability of sewage treatment, so typhoid fever in Europe and United States, and also uh, raw selfish consumption is usually uh, or has been linked to various illnesses. Outbreak to consumption of seafoods from contaminated water has been reported, and is usually due to calcivirus, hepatitis A virus, as well as salmonella typhi. Fibrios so far has been the species that accounted for most of the outbreaks and other bacteria such as Salmonella, Sigella, Plesiomonas, and Listeria are also uh, part of this problem. Okay, I would like to go through uh, the microbiological aspect to see what hazards, microbiological hazards that are commonly found in seafoods and what it and what do they do to uh, our health? So here is our, uh, the Fibrios group. Fibrio are naturally occurring in brackish water. So it's sort of difficult to avoid it. And uh, there are several of them. Fibrio cholera cause cholera. And then uh, Fulnificus causes uh, infection, uh, septicemia and cutaneous infection while parahemolyticus and mimicus usually are related to uh, gastroenteritis. Okay, the foods that has been linked to fibrios are plenty, uh, selfish, especially oyster, shrimp, etc. And then uh, the second one is salmonella group. These are not naturally occurring. It's different from fibrio, so usually it come from human or environment. And it may come in the form of typhi, which cause typhoid fever, or paratyphi that cause enric fever, as well as other, many other, thousand other salmonella that can cause gastroenteritis. Okay, viruses, I mentioned before, uh, hepatitis, A and V, uh, they are actually easily killed, but usually it can contaminate it. It can contaminate the, the seafood. And if they are not processed or eaten raw, then it can cause uh, illnesses or damage in your liver. This, on the right uh, column, you can see foods that has been associated with viruses. And then there's also parasites, uh, helminthic parasites such as Anisacus. Uh, they are also heat sensitive as uh, similar to viruses. Uh, both of these are usually related to human feces, but parasites such as Anisacus usually come from uh, seafood or any smaller food that may uh, be living together with a definitive host such as dolphin, okay? Um, both virus and parasite uh, are different from the above bacteria because they don't grow in the food, okay? And some of these microorganisms uh, in seafood could also uh, produce toxins, which then result in chemical hazards. Uh, this table shows you several toxins that can be produced by uh, bacteria that are commonly associated with seafoods and has caused some of the outbreaks. The first one probably you already know, uh, botulinum toxins by Clostridium botulinum, especially the type E process, it can cause paralysis. And it has caused, or it has been found in home salted fish, dry salted fish, and then there is a uh, incident with a beach whale in Alaska. And then there's histamine. You probably are aware of this thing. These are uh, components or converted components from histidine uh, done by several microorganisms, including Oenococcus, Lactobacillus, and Pediococcus, and usually <coughs> in a scomroid fish. That's why histamine is sometimes called a scomrotoxin. And then you can see tetrodotoxins. This is a, a usually occur in puffer fish, mahi-mahi, porcupine fish. Uh, and then saxitoxin, this is causing paralysis. That's why it's called paralytic shellfish poisoning, usually associated with fish. And saxitoxin is produced by dinoflagellate. The moic toxin, similarly, form, uh, also produced by uh, diatoms cause amnesic shellfish poisoning. From the name, you can see it's called amnesia. And then ocadiac acid causing uh, formatting. Okay, uh, so uh, both, uh, so the microorganism can exist as the microorganism itself causing infection, but they may also produce a toxin that can cause intoxication. Okay, so where are they come from? So uh, the contaminants in seafoods are dependent on the nature of the living environment. 
in the environment itself and then the mode of feeding and then the harvest season sometimes also affect uh, the load of microorganisms and also handling and preparation. Fish, mollusks, and crustaceans may acquire pathogen from various sources. Uh, all seafood can be susceptible, susceptible to surface and tissue contamination from the marine environment. The more polluted they are, the more contaminated, the more likely uh, they are going to be contaminated. The bivalve mollusks are a bit special because they have a filter feeding modes. So they basically filtering large volumes of water. And during this process, they may accumulate and concentrate pathogenic microorganisms that are naturally present in harvest water, such as fibrios, because fibrios are naturally found in the uh, environment. And that contamination of seafood by pathogen can also come from the human, especially when the um, wastewater treatment are not sufficient. Therefore, you end up with salmonella uh, and all of their friends uh, that come from, uh, and also viruses that come from uh, people's fecal materials. So here are the uh, activity that may end up contaminating your, your uh, uh, body water, overboard sewage discharge into the harvest area, illegal harvesting from sewage contaminated waters, sewage runoff from points inland after heavy rains or flooding. And then after the seafood harvested, there's also a, a chain of uh, handling, processing and preparation that may contribute to the presence or to the growth of microorganisms. The contributing factors include uh, abuse temperature, uh, contamination by infected food handlers, so that's poor uh, hygienic practices, and then cross-contamination through contact with contaminated seafoods or seawaters. Okay, uh, here are some of the objects. Uh, since uh, the complete data are not fine in Indonesia, I'm just going to pick up a data, for example, from the U.S. Between 1970. T3 and 2006, they report that Fibrio has contributed up to 54% of the outbreaks, Salmonella and Sigella 10% each, Listeria monocytogenes 1%. You can see the number is low. However, the problem with Listeria is the fatality is generally high. So even though the percentage is low, but sometimes the impact are quite high. And then Clostridium botulinum toxin accounted for 25%, and Staph aureus enrotoxin is in less than 5%. Norovirus, uh, usually or primarily uh, associated with bivalve mollusk and uh, finfish, causes 16% of the seafood related outbreaks and almost 30% of all of the illnesses because norovirus also associated with fruits such as raspberry, etc. Hepatitis A, primarily with bivalve mollusk from uh, polluted water, is responsible for 5% of all seafood-related outbreaks and illnesses. So how do we do about handling this microorganism in seafood? We all know that heating is very effective for inactivating microorganisms in seafood. So heating has been the very effective tools or technology for handling this. There are two types of um, technology that commonly applied. Uh, pasteurization, you know, in Indonesia, there's a lot of crab pasteurization. And this pasteurized crab usually go directly to for export in the US, etc. Uh, this process is an inactivation of five to six log cycles of target vegetative microorganism, can be Listeria or Salmonella, for example. So we call it 5D or 6D process. And then the more severe um, or more excess uh, technology, uh, commercial sterilization, usually the target is inactivation of 12 log cycles of spore forming Clostridium botulinum. That's why we call it 12D process or bot cook. Okay, uh, both. Um, Technology has been applied, has been uh, industrialized. Pasteurization usually are uh, more mild. Therefore, probably the texture, the nutrient are well maintained, uh, better maintained, I would say. But it requires cold chain. It requires refrigeration. Commercial sterilization will leave you with a product that usually can stay at room temperature for one to two years. So uh, in terms of um, 
technology, this is a choice that can be used. So the only, uh, so we know that heating is very effective. The only uh, limitation is usually heating affects sensory uh, or organoleptic quality. And people sometimes want to eat uh, seafood raw. You, you don't pasteurize uh, your sushi, for example. Or, and uh, sometimes you want to prepare in ways that usually do not have any kill step or does not kill the organism. That's why many uh, technology has been uh, developing. And here are some of the non-thermal technology, irradiation, high pressure processing, uh, et cetera. The one in both I will cover in uh, today's lecture. The others, I don't think we will have time, so I'm going to leave it as it is. But you know that there are plenty of uh, non-thermal technology. Usually the advantage is the fact that the sensory quality is less affected. So you can have the food um, mimics or similar to what it was before processing. Right. So irradiation is the application of high energy to food um, to inactivate microorganisms, not only microorganisms, actually insects, and also to prevent germination. Uh, the irradiation is rely on this high energy. Uh, if you remember, high energy mean uh, Planck constants time frequency, and frequency is speed of light uh, over uh, wavelength. So this radiation, if you remember your uh, electro um, spectrum, the energy spectrum, this is from radio waves. Uh, and then this is a microwave, infrared, visible lights, ultraviolets, and the X-rays and uh, gamma rays. Irradiance, irradiation is probably the oldest non-thermal technology um, available. Radiation is uh, stands for ionizing radiation using this uh, spectrum of X-rays and gamma rays, uh, the highest one of the high energy uh, to uh, inactivate microorganisms. Okay, so I told you before that irradiation is an old technology. So in 19, oh sorry, 1895, actually the first paper on the idea of using irradiation technology for foods has uh, published. And then uh, 1905, the first patent on food radiation technology also happened. Uh, there's a program in the US called Atom for Peace program, 1950. And then the first commercial application of irradiation technology for controlling insect and in spices uh, happened in uh, 1957. 1963, uh, this irradiation technology is applied for wheat and flour for uh, inhibiting insect infestation, 64 uh, application for inhibiting uh, sprouting in potatoes, and then irradiation of beef for astronauts meal in 1970, 1983 is inactivation of insect and microorganism in spices in condiment, control of helminthic parasites, trichinella spiralis in pork in 1985-86 is uh, control of insect and ripening of fruits and vegetables. You can see the versatility of uh, the use of this irradiation. And then control of bacteria and poultry and beef and then so on. Okay, so it's a very long history of irradiation. The source of irradiation, there are some of them. I'm going to mention two of them only. Cobalt-60 usually is uh, uh, using a cobalt. The cobalt is usually buried. Uh, underneath in water. And then when you will be using it, you will pop it up here to meet with the food, the food that was uh, entering the uh, conveyor belt and then process in this chamber. Okay, so based on the time, usually you can uh, adjust the um, dosage uh, to what you want to eliminate. Another source of uh, irradiation is electronic beam. Okay, the E-beam, uh, as opposed to cobalt, they are using electronics to create the radiation and then place in this uh, chamber where you put the food and then you can also uh, result in our, your products. Your products are uh, 
um, belted or uh, placed in other under a uh, room or other place. Okay, so uh, radiation uh, can be in Indonesia, for example, we have only I think the cobalt sixty as a government button, and then there's also uh, e beam. I believe is from the commercial. Okay, so what does the irradiation do? The irradiation actually will cause uh, ionization. Remember, it's called ionization radiation or irradiation, ionization of the electron that cause the damage in the DNA. So in the bacteria, there will be damage uh, in the DNA. If the DNA damage, then the replication will not occur. And then starting out the degradation of lipid of the membrane, changes in membrane permeability of bacteria, leaking of the cell components will result in uh, the death of microorganism. And sometimes free radical can be a form due to radiolysis of water. So this is uh, the main mechanism on why a bacteria or microorganism or other cells can be uh, inactivated by radiation. Okay, so food irradiation has been in place for a long time for uh, extending extending uh, shelf life because destroying, for example, the target is destroying the spoilage microorganism, can be used to improve food safety because, for example, you target to uh, eliminate salmon from your uh, shrimp, for example, and delay or eliminate sprouting or ripening, so it can be used to control the ripening of uh, fruit, for example, and also control insect and invasive pests. The application can be differentiated uh, into three. The first one, the low dose, is called redurization. This is similar to pasteurization, similar to what I mentioned before. When in a thermal process, there is a pasteurization, a five to six log uh, reduction. You can also apply a medium uh, concentration. The, the, the unit is kilogray, one to 10 kilogray. It's called redesidation. Or you can apply high dose above 10, usually 10 to 50 kilogray, that's called red apertization. The benefit of food irradiation is you don't get the uh, changes in the sensory quality of food. So you can have your strawberry, for example, exactly the same. Or also if you irradiate shrimp, for example, then the shrimp is not um, going to be cooked. It, it, it is still raw shrimp. So in terms of um, safety, actually there are so many independent research that has been published suggesting the safety of this process. So there is no question about it. WHO, US and EU has all published the, and suggesting the safety. It is a proof on various food. However, I think uh, because of the name or whatever, uh, the application is limited or varies. Okay, uh, this is some uh, some of the uh, differences. Europe actually has established a radiation facility for shrimp and Belgium. US FDA approved irradiation for shrimp, prawns, crab, lobster, and many other seafoods uh, for eliminating foodborne pathogen and extend shelf life. This is in 2014. And however, high dose, that is the red apertization, above uh, or similar to 10 kilo gray is not uh, permitted for commercial processing by the FDA as well as by EFSA in European Union. For example, the difference here you can see in Austria, Austria Germany and Greece, up to 10 kilo gray is used only for dry spices, herbs and uh, seasoning. However, in Pakistan and uh, Pakistan and Brazil, the radiation is applied for all, all foods. Okay, uh, Codex, this is a, a food bodies, food international bodies, FDA and EFSA actually uh, still require that irradiated foods or food containing uh, irradiated ingredient has to be labeled. There is a logo here suggesting uh, for transparency, you tell people who consume it that there has been irradiated. Okay. So here are some of the uh, research or a pilot plan project for 
application in seafood. For example, vacuum pack irradiated sea brim samples and uh, stored under refrigeration based on the sensory using three kilo gray, uh, triple the shelf life of sea brim. So the shelf life is increased by three times. And then gamma radiation at one or three kilo gray, I stored fresh Atlantic host mackerel has four days longer shelf life. So it can be used to improve the shelf life. And then here uh, on ice stored horse mackerel, uh, the electrophoretic pattern of the mackerel master protein is not affected. So that's good news. So everything is still the same uh, nutrient wise. And then effect of radiation up to six kilogram on physical chemical properties, microbial quality and shelf life of Thai fermented fish mints. Uh, they said that at six kilogram, it inhibit microbial growth but yeah. induce lipid and protein oxidation. So they lower down the dose at two kilogram, which result in no negative effect on quality. So what they want to have is a killing of the microorganism without affecting uh, the uh, quality uh, parameters. Okay, so those are uh, the story of the irradiation. Uh, in Indonesia also, we know there are uh, there is a facility for irradiation. Okay, next is uh, high hydrostatic pressures. So that's uh, usually uh, abbreviated as HHP, but also sometimes people call it high pressure processing or hydrostatic pressure processing, which is abbreviated as HPP, so don't be confused. This is a method of preserving food, a non-thermal one, in which the product is processed under very high pressure. So you're putting them in a place and give them a high pressure, leading to the inactivation of microorganism and enzymes. So the purpose is still how to control this microorganism. The pressures applied uh, usually are 100 to uh, 600 uh, megapascals, but can be as high as 1,200 1, or 1,200 megapascal for spore inactivation. So this one is equal to sterilization. HHP effect on microorganism and enzyme is similar to high temperature. Uh, microorganism inactivation is a result of cellular damage. We will see the picture later. And biochemical changes resulting from food exposed to high activation pressures. Actually, in the past, we uh, in the lab, for example, uh, people or microbiologists usually break open bacteria using a high pressure, but now it can be applied for food. So fungi are usually more susceptible, so mold and yeast, uh, followed by gram-positive and then gram-negative bacteria. So bacteria is uh, less susceptible. Okay, uh, actually HHP also has been uh, long time developed. The develop, early development is in 1884, in which there is a early experiments and then study on the effect of the high processing, high pressure processing on inactivation of microorganism in meat, juice and milk. Okay, but the device is not feasible. Some experiments then done with uh, fruit, fruit juice, and some vegetables with a mixed success, 1914. And then report shows 1918 that it is not always, uh, it, it doesn't always kill uh, spores. Usually only vegetative bacteria are, are killed. And then there's early uh, more uh, collaborative effort in University of Delaware, 19. 84, but in Japan, uh, 1990, the first commercial uh, juices made with HHP is in the market. At the same time, there is a, the program that uh, initiated in Delaware becoming bigger. Uh, collaboration is expanded to Oregon State University and Natick Shoulder Research Development and Engineering Center at Massachusetts. And there was a industry university high pressure consortium uh, formed. Okay, the result of this collaboration and also Japan and Europe is the first uh, published publication of a book covering this uh, high pressure processing or high uh, hydrostatic high hydrostatic processing. And 1994, uh, the probably would say the. Um, 
the, the Bible of the pro high processing is published in 1995. Okay, so this is the history. So uh, this technology is not uh, something that is very new. It has been developed over a decade. Okay. Oh, sorry, over a century. So what do we do in a high pressure, uh, high hydrostatic pressure uh, apparatus or equipment? So you will have this uh, water tank transmitting medium placed in a chamber. And then you're gonna prepare your food, usually can be solid or liquid. Okay. And then you place them inside and then you give them a high pressure to this chamber. And what do you expect? You expect your product to uh, have a lower uh, number of microorganisms, but sometimes there are some changes happen in the protein or in the lipid or uh, on the color of the product. That's why uh, many adjustments has to be done. However, in terms of, uh, so in the, so it can change the nutrient, although sometimes it's expected. For example, when you want uh, your protein to be uh, changed such that it is no longer allergenic. So this technology can also cover that, okay? So here is the chamber where uh, the food is placed and the pressure is made, okay? So what happened to microorganisms when they are given a high hydrostatic pressure? Uh, this is a model that uh, has been studied for E. coli. So of course, it's going to be a bit different for, for example, gram-positive bacteria. In the left, you can see the intact uh, cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Usually, uh, you have calcium that help stabilize the lipopolysaccharide, LPS. And the bottom of it, there is a lipid A that is tandemly or is sort of buried in the lipid of the membrane. This is uh, the this is the lipid bilayer and then peptidoglycan. So in the very bottom is actually inside the cell. So what happened if you apply a pressure? Oh, okay, sorry, I forgot about this protein in the membrane. It's called outer membrane protein. So when you apply the pressure, so there will be a disruption of electrostatic interaction between this calcium and the LPS that caused them to loosen up. So there is a dissociation of the LPS here, leaving the membrane, as well as the lipid A, okay? Sometimes the OMP is also disintegrate. So what leaf or what left are, oh, sorry, are this membrane. I thought I already put the picture, but I forgot. So here's the, the um, unstable membrane because of losing LPS, et cetera. And when it is not, uh, it's no longer uh, stable or becoming more permeable, then it permits entry of any hydrophobic inhibitors that make further cause um, the death of microorganism. Okay, so as I mentioned before, HSP have some limitation in terms of uh, the use because of the color changes and rancidity because of the uh, effect on the lipid. Okay, so this is the side effect. So usually people want to optimize the uh, high pressure pasteurization such that lower level of protein denaturation and uh, enhanced organoleptic properties um, is achieved. So people can do this, people will do optimization to achieve the uh, better product. Here are some research. Tuna exposed to 220 megapascals for 30 minutes. You have an improved texture. You got inhibition of proteolysis and low level of uh, total volatile base. That means a lower spoilage as well as histamine. HHP at 200 MPA substantially increased the shelf life of yellow fin tuna chunks. Here's another study. Another study also suggests that HHP on tiger shrimp at 435 megapascal increased the shelf life of, uh, three times. Okay, combine HHP and uh, vacuum pack. Okay, vacuum packaging for trout start at uh, 3.5 degrees Celsius. Oh, sorry, the shelf life increased from three to five days and control to three to four weeks. 
Okay, so uh, this technology has been proven to be able to increase the shelf life. People have to optimize to reduce the color changes that may occur. Okay, here uh, other studies, clams treated with HHP. So people, if they want to eat um, uncooked clam or very lightly heated clam, you have less worry now because you can do uh, HHP and reduction of the total pet count 90% uh, with the pressure of 480 megapascal. Raw oysters, people want to eat oyster raw, treated with uh, HHP uh, 230 to 586 megapascal is uh, res uh, leads to reduction of Vibrio up to six log CFU per gram. Okay, and then oyster treated with HHP uh, 260 to 600 megapascal. All HHP treatment reduce microbial counts to undetectable levels. Some changes in color observed during storage. This is the problem that sometimes occur. But HHP prevents spoilage of chilled stored oysters, although sometimes affect product quality because it changed the color. Okay, so. Um, the application of HPP and the studies is HPP are, are HHP are quite uh, extensive. You can see many papers on this uh, for, uh, especially because people want to eat things raw. So they want to make sure because if you apply HSP, the texture does not change, the appearance does not change. Okay, the next technology uh, is called pulse electric fill, yeah. pulse electric fill processing. Oh, sorry, this one is somehow got double. It's a non-thermal technique used mainly for inactivation of microbes, but can also be used for extraction, drying, and other mass transfer processes. Okay. BF technology is applying the short pulses of a strong electrical current. So you give electric currents in a short duration in the range of microseconds to milliseconds and intensity in the order of 10 to 80 kilovolt per centimeter with the goal to inhibit microbial growth. This technology can be applied to liquid or semi-solid foods, not for a solid food yet, but in seafood technology, I mean, in as compared to irradiation and high uh, hydrostatic pressures, this technology are probably is still less used. And in seafood technology, it's actually more uh, pursued for extraction, for example, collagen or calcium extraction from fish bones. Okay, so as you can see here, the timeline is also not as old as irradiation or HHP. Uh, there's a pioneer work in Germany uh, in 1960 by Heinz Dovenspeck and UK by Sill and Hamilton. In 1980, a um, company in Germany developed uh, two tools, Alcrax and Alsteril, and tried it on various um, foods, including for fish slurry. So it's a... Uh, mushy fish, but uh, the project is considered failed and then dismantled. So throughout the next 15 years, uh, studies go back to the lab in which uh, people trying to uh, figure out the mechanisms of action and the key factors uh, for the application. Okay, So they try with uh, pretreatment for fruit, for vegetables, tissue prior to extraction, for drying, for microbial decontamination of liquid food, etc., and then the attempts to industrialize the PEF application is renewed in 1995, and first commercialization of PEF for pasteurized juice, I believe, uh, occurred in 2005. So this is a more um, current uh, in terms of development is, is a bit later than uh, the two technologies I mentioned before. Okay, so PEF technology is placing a food in a chamber. Okay, here is the chamber, oops, sorry. This is the chamber in the middle. And then you uh, put two electrodes in these vessels 
and then you give away electric pulses through this electrode and this electrode will conduct the high intensity electrical pulse to the product that was placed between the two okay. that caused microbial death so we hear or meat in here okay so what happened to microorganism during this pef uh, so here is uh, in the very left is the picture of cell membrane and all of the compound in the cytoplasm before PEF application. By giving away the pulse electric fields, you will uh, cause the um, polarization of the charges, which result in the structural change and local membrane damage. In the very right, you can see the pores are formed and in the beginning or when your current given is not that high, you may have a small pores as compared to the whole uh, membrane. And if that will happen, then um, the damage is still reversible. So by adjusting or increasing the pulse width and or number, you can have uh, an increase in electric field strength and the intensity of the treatment of the PF treatment is uh, higher. And this will promote the formation of larger pores. You want the pores to be larger so that the damage to the cell membrane occur, which lead to the cell death because the contain the content of the cytoplasm are leaking out. As you can see here, this is the reason why this method can be used for extraction because you can extract what's inside a cell, okay? Or you can also use this technology for drying. I mentioned before, right? It can be used for extraction and it can be also used for um, drying. Okay, so those are the three uh, technology that um, are um, commonly uh, done or has been developed uh, and in a commercial use actually abroad, not probably not in Indonesia yet. I haven't seen any um, HHP product, for example, in Indonesia, although probably some uh, you can find it in Japan or in Australia, but not in Indonesia yet, I believe. Okay. So those are the three methods or the three uh, technology that commonly use. And then I'm going to go to the fourth approaches that people can use uh, in these matters. That is the use of natural preservatives. As you all know, people want to have a fresh product. People want to have a minimally processed food. You don't want it to be heated for a long time. And you don't want to use a well, many, many consumers don't want to use chemical additives. And this kind of has forced uh, industry to uh, explore the application of natural preservatives to maintain the quality and safety of foods, including seafoods. However, you, uh, even though there are many studies, however, we all know that the, in terms of commercial, probably not many yet uh, to be used. Okay? Because there are a requirement, of course, for these preservatives to be used. First, they have to be effective against a broad spectrum of bacteria and fungi. So if they are only um, usable for one bacteria, bacterium, for example, and it's probably uh, not effective to be used in food. And then active at low concentration, because when you have to use a lot of them, that you're going to run uh, into problem of cost. Okay, And then non-toxic, they can also be causing um, intoxication in people. And you also don't want them, if you use them high enough, that um, affect the sensory, the taste, for example, then you don't want to do it, even though it's safe, but it, it become um, so off from the original uh, sensory properties, then you don't want it. Okay. And then should impart no flavor, that one, or color. Also, if you use them in a 
amount such that it changed the color of your product also usually is not wanted. And then of course, at the end, it should be cost effective because uh, if it is too expensive, then it's gonna make your product coming very expensive. There are many categories of natural preservatives. Uh, it can be usually divided or classified into organic acids and then essential oils, plant extracts, algal extracts, bacteriocins or well, this one probably should not be bacteriocinic as a biopreservation. And then also uh, ketosan. I did not highlight the ketosan because I dropped it from this discussion because I thought it's gonna be just too wide. Although I know probably most of you will be interested on ketosan. All right, so let's start with the easy one. Organic acid has been long used by people. People have been preserving food with organic acid. So what is organic acid? Any compound bearing one or more carboxyl groups that possess antimicrobial properties. Usually these components are hydrophobic. Therefore, they can be soluble in the lipids of the cell membrane. I've mentioned before, many times I'll show you, I have shown you the picture of the membrane and they are uh, consist of a lipid bilayer. Therefore, they are very uh, hydrophobic. Okay, so if uh, this organic acid, uh, the cell membrane, and if they can cross into the cytoplasm, what happened? within the cell, when they enter the cytoplasm, the high pH of cytoplasm have a pH of about seven, then pH, uh, then it will start the dissociation. When the dissociation happen, so you can get the RCOO minus plus uh, hydrogen ion and the accumulation of hydrogen ion, which cannot exit through the cell membrane will cause the acidification of the inside of the cell. So the, the bacterial cell membrane inside the cell membrane becoming so uh, acid, if it is so acid and then it's gonna start uh, affecting the work of the enzymes, creating a hurdle for the growth and proliferation. Okay, the picture is shown here. So if you see this one is a picture of RCOH is the organic acids, you, if the organic acid is um, hydrophobic, so it will be able to enter the cell membrane here. Inside the cell, it will split into RCOO, RCOO here, which may interact with DNA, but I think the main uh, issue here is, is the uh, proton, the hydrogen ion produced, which will be accumulated in cause of the acidification of inside the cell. So the pH is so low that some of the enzyme are becoming uh, ineffective. We haven't discussed about essential oil, but essential oils are also essentially hydrophobic. So it works similarly. It could enter the bacteria uh, through the um, cell membrane. Okay. Okay. So when we use organic acid, Usually, uh, the use or the factors that affect the antimicrobial activity of the organic acid includes the type of microorganism. Some bacteria uh, are probably uh, more affected by pH than yeast and mold. And then the polarity or the size of the molecules. And then the PKA of the acid that enable them to cross the cell membrane. We all know that the PKA is the, uh, the uh, pH in which it starts to dissociate. To ensure that organic acid dissociate at different pH sometimes because uh, one probably dissociate at a lower uh, pH, the others at a higher, sometimes a use of a mixture of acid is used. Therefore, there is a synergistic effect. In addition, organic acids such as ascorbic and citric acid also could chelate metals such as uh, cuprum and iron, okay, uh, which cause the metal unable to act as oxidation propagator. So it could also act as uh, antioxidants. Organic acid has been approved for as food additives. They are uh, categorized as generally recognized as safe. So use of this is not a problem. 
Here are some of the studies and the application in the seafood. Usually, um, or if it is applied only to reduce bacterial load, then usually you can use it alone, but usually it part of the other technology that is applied. Okay, here are the spraying and dipping using organic acid as food preservatives. Okay, for example, the use of lactic acid and citric acid in the icing agent of European Hake and Megrim uh, have shown to inhibit growth of aerobic microorganism, anaerobic microorganism, psychotrophic, proteolytic, enterobacteriaceae, and also the formation of trimethyl amine. Okay, uh, I put uh, the reference in the bottom in most of this so that you can uh, read more. The direct addition of citric acid usually negatively affect the sensory properties. So as I mentioned before, we don't want to add acid that cause the food to be uh, unedible. People don't want to eat it because it tastes uh, funny, for example. So there is a solution for that. This paper shows how encapsulation can cause a uh, reduced effect on the sensory. And then uh, the last one is a paper by Asalam uh, using sodium lactate sodium acetate and citrate for the dipping of slices of, mm, it's a, tuna, a salmon slices. It extend the shelf life of the uh, salmon slice and delay the lipid oxidation during cold storage. So for example, if you're in a, um, uh, what do you call it, retail business, uh, you want to display your uh, tuna slice and by using this uh, acid, you can have them uh, longer uh, shelf life. Okay, the next one is uh, the essential oils, plant extract and alcohol extract. Let me drink for a moment. So these are three different things that actually will or can be used also as a natural preservatives. You all probably know that plant oils, uh, essential oils is usually plant oils. You can get it from the leaf, from the flower, from the uh, many part of the plants that is obtained usually by steam distillation. Of, of course, there are many other uh, methods occur that contain the volatile organic compounds. This EOs, as I mentioned before, is also hydrophobic. So they can interact with the bacterial lipid membrane cause the membrane to increase in permeability, and then they might uh, leak some of the component that can cause to cell death. Gram-positive bacteria are usually more sensitive to EOs than gram-negative. The next one is plant extract. This one is usually uh, not the oil part, but the one that extracted using uh, solvent. And you can uh, found different group of uh, chemicals terpenes, phenolic compounds, and alkaloids. Uh, terpene and phenolic compounds uh, is also, are also hydrophobic, so they can destabilize the cellular structure by solubilizing the lipid bilayer, the membrane again, increase permeability of cell membrane, and so loss of cellular constituents, so the latter is the same thing as what happened to acid or essential oil. Lately, algal extract has also be, uh, been uh, explored for its antimicrobial activity, either from the red alga, brown or green microalga or seaweeds. And the bi uh, it has been found that this also contains similar components found in plant, such as polyphenol, carotenoids, uh, alkaloids, uh, phycocyanins, and terpenes. So it will act similarly to the above, okay? So what is uh, plant extract and uh, essential oil? They are actually naturally occurring plant defense mechanism. So it has been uh, embedded in their system and the role is to control micro or other microorganisms. So therefore uh, this component when it is extracted are efficient in controlling foodborne pathogens and uh, spoilage microorganisms. EOS and PE as seafood preservatives has been applied at a concentration of 0.1 to 1%. 
because when it's used in higher concentration in, mon in most cases, uh, there is a negative effect on the sensory. So the taste or the flavor has changed, okay? So the bottom is a study uh, using uh, oxygen absorber, absorber in combination with uh, essential oil of organo and then uh, apply them uh, for the rainbow trout fillet stored under refrigeration. So most of this are used to uh, prolong the shelf life of uh, raw uh, seafoods. The results shows that um, the microbial growth to unaccepted label uh, levels, that is when uh, the number of total viable count reach seven log uh, CFU per gram, occur in day four for the control without addition of the two, the oxygen absorber and uh, EOA, uh, OEA, organo essential oil. But in the OEA group and the oxygen uh, absorber group, or the oxygen absorber and OEO group, uh, the spoilage occur at, on day 14. So you can see here there are uh, eight days uh, extension in terms of uh, microbial growth. When we look at the sensory um, quality, that is when you smell them, apparently for the day four of the control is rejected, but for the one uh, using uh, oxygen absorber and uh, essential oil of organo can still be accepted up to 17 days. Okay. Although the microorganism already reached uh, seven log CFU per gram. Okay. <clears throat> These are uh, the application. Uh, I look at the data in Indonesia and seen there are so many uh, potential of local plants uh, and also algae. Uh, for the preservation of seafood. Here are some of the our colleagues uh, studies showing that addition of, for example, 1% of red ginger or red galangal uh, essential oils in edible coating could increase the shelf life of patin filet stored at four degree for two to four days. And then there's a uh, atung. This one I believe is a plant uh, typical to Maluku. And addition of 0.3% of atung powder this is uh, just uh, you measure it with the powder of the atom, dried atom, uh, resulted in a better sensory and microbiological quality as compared to control. Okay, and then the same atom is also used for soaking swordfish prior to smoking, and it is concluded that it maintained quality for four days. And then there's uh, other study using red algae extracts for preservation of tilapia fillet and 600 ppm extract has potential as a natural natural preservatives based on TPC and organoleptic test. So as you can see here, this is probably in the area for Indonesia because we have so many um, a diversity in the plants. There's a very uh, large potential of uh, preservatives can be uh, derived. <coughs> okay, and lastly, uh, is the biopreservation. Biopreservation is usually uh, defined as the application of naturally occurring microorganisms and all their antimicrobial metabolites to preserve the quality of food and extend their shelf life. So there are various microorganisms, but usually people work with lactic acid bacteria because First, they are uh, considered or categorized as grass. So it's usually considered a safe. Uh, there are several uh, species belonging to lactic acid bacteria. That is, for example, lactobacillus, lactococcus, pediococcus, leuconostoc, and streptococcus. Uh, the reason why this bacteria can become uh, or can act as a in a preservation is because they will compete for nutrient with other bacteria and if they compete with pathogen or spoilers and if they can overgrow the others, they then uh, the food will be safer or less easily to get spoiled. And lactic acid bacteria produce metabolites. So not only the bacteria, but the metabolites that they produce uh, usually also have antimicrobial activity. Now to mention 
organic acid. We discussed it before. So organic acid can be produced by lactic acid bacteria, such as lactic acid and acetic acid. So when we add this lactic acid bacteria to product, it could work as the competitor for other bacteria, but also as an inhibitor because they produce lactic acid, for example. And then they also produce antimicrobial peptides that is called bacteriostin. I will have it in the next slide, as well as diacetyl and hydrogen peroxide. You, we all know acid inhibits various microorganisms because of the pH reduction I mentioned previously. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, strongly oxidized lipid of cell membrane, can destroy the molecular structure of cellular protein. And the diacetyl deactivate microbial enzymes by blocking or modifying the catalytic site. So having lactic acid bacteria in a system uh, is a biopreservatives or is a process of biopreservation. <coughs> so I mentioned especially for bacteriocin because bacteriocin is a, well, sometimes or in the past, sometimes people got confused or mixed it up with the antibiotic. But uh, bacteriocin is different from antibiotic because it is a peptide or protein. So bacteriocin is a biopreservative in food. Uh, and usually when it's used in food, it does not uh, cause changes in uh, sensory attributes. It's very important for we all know when it comes to food, you want them to be preserved, but you don't want to any changes or you want a very small changes in terms of uh, sensory quality such as color or texture or uh, mm, for example, um, uh, yeah, texture or color or flavor, for example, okay? So bacteriocin are small peptides or proteins with bactericidal or bacteriostatic action. So it cost, uh, it can kill other bacteria or it can inhibit bacteriostatic other bacteria. They function by adsorption followed, so it got absorbed and then penetrated to the cell membrane. Through the pores they create, so they create pores and the pores that they create will increase membrane permeability. It can cause loss of the anything inside the cells such as ATP, amino acid, potassium or magnesium. Uh, there are many considerations, though, uh, when we use bacteriocin um, per se. I mean, if we only use the bacteriocin as a preservative, that is uh, some of the properties that we all have to know. For example, interaction with proteins and lipids will reduce its activity. Uh, if there are proteases, because bacteriocin is a protein, it tends to inactivate the bacteriocin. Uh, pH, uh, temperature also affecting it. Okay, well, high temperature will, uh, of course, denaturate the bacteriocin. Initial contamination of food, bacteriocin are usually not very strong inhibitors. So if the contamination is too high, usually they can't work alone. And then composition of the product natural microflora. Bacteriocin usually inhibit gram positive, but not very strong in uh, gram negative. So the use is a bit limited, but if we put a lactic acid bacteria in a system, you probably get the bacteria, you got the acid and you got the bacteriocin. Okay, here is some of the studies that people have done. So biopreservation potential of lactobacillus curvatus on young Hague and Megrim, a type of fish, I believe. Uh, LAB culture and selfie culture supernatan added to the fish and then stored in ice at two degree at the retail fish market for 40s. And then they, uh, they concluded that the treated fish has a significantly lower bacterial cons as compared to the control. So the growth of uh, spoilage bacteria is inhibited. And then other studies suggesting that uh, are showing uh, that lactobacillus pentosus on fresh salmon fillet inoculated with a uh, competitor a pathogen such as listeria and then refrigerated. Uh, apparently, the lactobacillus pentosus significantly reduces Aeromonas hydrophila as well as the listeria monocytogenes. 
the inhibitory properties of 16 LAB and bifidobacteria on 32 spoilage organism and vacuum packed raw Atlantic salmon. The results suggest that uh, the presence of Lactococcus lactis, subspecies lactis, uh, so of, of the 32, uh, of, of out of the 16 lactic acid bacteria, lacti Lactococcus lactis, subspecies lactis is the most effective inhibitory strain. It increased shelf life, did not alter the sensory, that's, that's good, and also does not change the texture of the face. So there are plenty of studies. Uh, similarly, there are some studies in Indonesia here, uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, and added a starter culture for, this is usually for uh, traditional fermented food called rusip, results in a better sensory quality. And then Lactobacillus plantarum and fermentum or its combination results in better quality as uh, monitored by the lower uh, total volatile base of fish sausage, sausage fermented as 20 degree for four days. And then uh, work also has been done by screening uh, bacteriocin compounds of 25 isolates from Bekasam. Bekasam is uh, fermented fish. And uh, out of the 25 isolates, uh, 11 of them are potential bacteriocin producer. It shows inhibitory zones of E. coli, Salmonella typhimurium, Bacillus cereus, Staph aureus, and Listeria monocytogenes. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, so we, this is my last slide, I believe. I'm not uh, doing any clo closing statement because I think there are all just um, many uh, approaches that you can use and maybe use in combination with, for example, you can uh, use electro, um, electronic field to cause the pore in bacteria and then add, uh, for example, phenolic compounds so that it will enter the bacteria easy, easier as a, we call it hurdle technology. So you use more than one technology. So I think that's all my uh, lecture for today. I'm gonna stop share and uh, let the moderator to, uh, I, I think I finished earlier than what you asked, but it's okay, right? Okay. It's okay. Thank you very much, Doctor uh, Professor Rati for your lecture. It's really insightful. And I think all the participants enjoy this lecture because we already have so many questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, will, you will read it for me, right? Of course. <laughs> so uh, before I read the question from the chat box, uh, everyone in uh, this Zoom meeting, if you want to ask the question directly to Professor Rati, you can raise your hands and I will uh, let you ask your question by yourself. So... Uh, waiting for the participant who want to ask the question by themselves. I will read the first question. It's from Joanne Faye. She asks, uh, does irradiation cause chemical changes in food uh, producing substance not known to be present in non-irradiated food? Okay, do you want me to answer right away or how, uh, are, how do you I want think, me to? Uh, uh, if you uh, want to answer directly, Sure. Okay. Well, I will try to answer. I, as I mentioned to you, I'm not actually I'm not a food engineer, but okay. So, which one is the first question? Sorry. Uh, does irradiation oh. cause chemical changes in food? Okay. So the studies uh, suggest uh, or the reports on irradiation, if they are used at the dose recommended, there are three codex guidance for this then it's supposed to be safe. There should not be any excessive or causing the food to become radioactive. So if you follow the guideline, there is a good practices, there is a several regulation on this, uh, it should not, okay? Uh, actually, the, the irradiation has been proven scientifically everywhere as a safe. I think um, the cultural or the psychological effect, that's a difference. People are not, uh, 
easily accepting this technology. But in terms of report, I can uh, share with you several uh, guidance or several studies independently done by uh, many international bodies suggesting that irradiation actually should not cause any of your problem that you mentioned, as long as it's, it's used in uh, the right dose. Okay, thank you, Professor Rati, for answering John. Maybe John wants to say something? No? Okay, uh, I will continue to the next question. It's from Larson. He asks, uh, why irradiation more than 10 kilogram is not allowed for commercial purpose? Yeah, it is not allowed in the US and in the EU, but it is allowed anywhere else because theoretically the above 10, that is usually 10 to um, 50 is a process that is uh, similar to sterilization. It is applied in many places. It's supposed to be safe, but I think every country have their rights to, to want to put a uh, limit on what they can or can't do. I don't think the reason is uh, safety related. They just, well, uh, because it it is applied in many other places. Okay. Okay. So uh, we also have next question from Joan, but I think it's better if Joan asks uh, the question by herself because uh, she have some data about it. Oh. Okay. And Joan. Hello, Joan. Oh, she's not answering. Yeah, you can you can go to. Okay, I will continue to another question. Uh, it's from Crossbell. What are some factors that contribute for the rapid deterioration of seafoods? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, I think there is one question before Rosabella, but it's okay. I can answer this. So uh, the rapid uh, actually there are many factors that really link to uh, rapid deterioration of seafood. As a food commodity, they have a high water content. The water activity is pretty high, allowing and the pH is close to neutral, allowing many bacteria to grow. So depending on what already aboard on the body of the seafood, then it just easily uh, grow in the food. So that's why, uh, for example, uh, refrigeration will help you uh, reduce the growth because you sort of slow down the growth of the microorganism. But uh, as a food, they have the perfect uh, factors for supporting the growth of microorganism. It has the good pH, it has a good water content, it has a good protein source. So we love fish or seafood and the microorganism also love it. So it's the rapid growth of the microorganism cause them to deteriorate quick, quickly. Okay, so the next question is from Larson. He asked, is there any effect if there is too much bacteria since produced by uh, lactic acid bacteria as food preservative? Well, to be honest, I can't answer that. I, <laughs> but, you know, I would say I don't think so because it is just a protein. So if we eat them, it's just peptide that we gonna uh, digest. And well, the thing is right now, and actually in the world, I think only niacin is allowed to be uh, used commercially. So mm -hmm. like I, I told you before, sometimes you make a limit, not because it's hazardous, it's just that you don't know much about it. So niacin is the only one uh, approved to be used. The others are not yet approved. So what people use or what people do actually, if I do fermentation and put the lactic acid bacteria, they produce the bacteriocin in there so it's self-preserved, but we don't put a pure bacteriocin except for niacin, because the only uh, bacteriocin that is allowed by law, by regulation uh, <laughs> everywhere now is niacin, okay? Okay, uh, for the next question, it's from Rosabella Malo again. Uh, for, for, for food safety concerns, 
Are, pro, are food processed by irradiation safe to eat? I think the answer is yes. Okay. Next question from Mr. Solomon. Uh, he asked, can you suggest some or appropriate treatment process on how to prolong the shelf life of smoked fish, which is one week to more than a week, even without refrigeration? Okay. So, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. So you might want to use the combination of the preservatives. Okay. So if you want to stick with the natural preservatives, then you may want to add the extract of plant or uh, uh, acid, yeah, uh, or other components that has been uh, studied. I think it, you may have to, of course, um, optimize optimize it, but you could probably try it. Or you can use, uh, I don't know, can you do the, because it's already smoke, right? So the smoking okay. itself actually have some uh, preservation effect. And the other thing that we have to know also, actually, in order for you to have a longer uh, shelf life, you have to start with the good quality of fish, mm -hmm. because good quality of fish have a lower load of microorganism. So if you sort your fish carefully, you can also have a longer shelf life usually. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now we have Elaine rising hands. Uh, Elaine, you can ask your question. Oh, hi, good afternoon, Prof. Rati. I would like hi. to ask your perspective uh, to my question. So like in nutritional perspective, right? People tend to have better bioavailability for absorbing nutrients by eating local food. So in your perspective, in terms can you can you I can hear you? Oh, what food? Uh, in local food? in consuming local food, so it's like we oh, okay. pro, we eat, we have better bioavailability. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So in terms of natural preservative application, will algae extract show better synergistic effect on stabilizing seafood shelf life and uh, then the plant from the land? Yeah. You know what? I'm sorry, Elaine. It's, it's an interesting question. I I would say, well, okay, so the components is similar. For example, I got uh, polyphenol from plants and then polyphenol from polyphenolic compound from uh, seafood. Yes. Uh, as, a, as a chemicals, they are working similarly. So as long as the dose is the same, usually it should work better. But you know what? I think it's very interesting of your question. I'm, I don't know the answer. You may want to do it for your research, for example, but I, I really don't have the, a good answer for that. Uh, uh, theoretically, the chemicals, if the chemicals are the same, so if the chemicals is the same, that means the dose is the uh, parameters that may dictate the effectiveness. However, again, I really do not have the answer for that. So you may want to study. I don't know for sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Prof. Ati. Sure. Okay. Um, since any, uh, nobody raising hand, so I will continue from the question in the chat box. We have question from William Vito. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I have some question. What is the composition of lactic acid bacteria to be able to make fermented products? And are there any harmful effects to the body if we consume fermented foods in excess? And what are some examples of product produced from other biopreservative bacteria besides lactic acid bacteria? Okay, let me answer one by one. Hmm. Okay, now I, I can open the chat so I can see. Okay, the first question is, what is the composition? What do you mean by composition? Okay, so lactic acid bacteria uh, traditionally has been used to make fermented food. So in, uh, I don't know where you're from, but in Indonesia, we use lactic acid bacteria in making sawi asin or uh, kimchi in Korea. Uh, we also use lactic acid bacteria actually work in the second part of fermentation of uh, soy sauce. And when you're making fish sauce also actually by uh, adding a lot of uh, salt 
in your fish, you actually um, screen for uh, lactic acid bacteria. So most of the bacteria that grow are lactic acid bacteria. So actually lactic acid bacteria is a microorganism that you can use and usually selecting them to be dominant in the, link, in the environment is by placing salt. Okay, so it's, it's naturally occurring in milk. That's why if you leave your milk uh, at room temperature, it will coagulate. And most of the time it's gonna be lactic acid bacteria, but if you do it that way, you don't have any control. You may also have the product uh, containing other bacteria. That's why people make yogurt. So you add the lactic acid bacteria purposely so that they will dominate and hopefully many other um, unwanted bacteria will not be there. So there are so many uh, lactic acid bacteria uh, used as a preservative, even, even in the long, long time ago when people don't know anything about this bacteria or the product or the preservation. But now we know that if I have a milk and I put um, lactic acid bacteria culture in it, I will end up with a very tasty yogurt. Okay, and then now with the knowledge that uh, this bacteria also good for our intestine, we actually purposely put lactic acid bacteria, not only for preservation, but for them to grow or to stay alive in our intestine. So that's what we call as a probiotic. But the, um, for example, uh, fish sauce, that one uh, is made by, for example, small fishes, put a lot of salt. You don't usually add lactic acid bacteria, but it will be there selected because of the high salt content. And then you're gonna make the, or you, you're gonna allow the lactic bacteria to chew on the, to eat on your uh, fish protein. And you got the broken down products from uh, the protein. So you got very tasty umami flavor of the broken down protein. Okay, so that's to answer the first one. You can make so many fermented food. Actually, many fermented food are uh, made of uh, or by uh, lactic acid bacteria. Are there any harmful effect if we consume fermented food in excess? Uh, so far, I don't see any uh, publication showing that. So I don't think so. Okay. What are some examples of products produced by other biopreservative bacteria besides? Actually, there are. Uh, several, uh, for example, when you make uh, nata de coco, those are preserved by, uh, well, that's not 100% not preservation, but it's preserved by acidic acid bacteria. Okay, so some acidic acid bacteria that also can work as a biopreservatives. Uh, propionibacterium, okay, propionibacterium uh, can produce propionic acid. Propionic acid is a preservative also. So if you make a product with propionic bacterium, you may be able to get a propionic acid that will self-preserve your food. Okay, so that's three of the examples. Okay, thank you Prof. Rati for the answer. We still have a lot of questions for you here. So <laughs> the next question is from Asida Rahman. Uh, she asked, is there any possible ways to prevent free radical form while using irradiation method on seafood since uh, it affects transidity? Um, actually, I don't think I mentioned that irradiation affects rancidity. I think it's HHP can affect rancidity. Okay? Irradiation mm -hmm. so far has not been reported to cause such things. So okay. uh, I think I, I think if you look at my uh, PowerPoint, I did not mention it. I think so far I don't think uh, irradiation has been linked has been linked to uh, rancidity. Okay. So for the next question, we have Fahmi. Uh, he asks, why different species require different pressure intensity in HPP? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and actually, Fahmi already answered some of it. You're right. Usually when we do the technology, we, we compromise because we want to have the inactivation of microorganisms. For example, I'm just give you an example, pasteurization. It's good because you still main, ma maintain a lot of nutrient there. You still have the taste uh, similar to the raw one. 
the cost that we have to pay, we have to have a, a um, cold chain that's expensive. So that's that's our technology. And we, when we do sterilization, we will uh, lose uh, some of the nutrient, but the technology is equipped now to do fortification. So that's less of a problem. But the more problem is uh, damage in the sensory. For example, you know, I don't know if you, you eat corned beef, right? Cornet. Corned beef is so mushy because you heat them, the beef is becoming so mushy. So actually the texture has changed. But the good thing about sterilization is you don't need refrigeration. So for example, in a pandemic situation, in a emergency situation, that will be a perfect food because you don't need refrigeration. For example, there's no electricity, etc., and it's ready to eat. You can open your can of corned beef and eat it right away without worrying a thing because it is uh, it has been processed and it can stay for two years at room temperature. So that's one example. So now when you talk about HPP or HHP, HHP is known to be able to kill microorganism. It will because of the pressure, it may change some of the conformation of the protein. Sometimes it's not wanted because uh, the texture of the product becoming, you don't want to have a uh, tuna that is soggy, etc. for example. So you usually have to adjust it to make sure the texture is still acceptable. On the other hand, sometimes, especially for the HSP, because of their capability to change the conformation of protein, it has been uh, made use by people to reduce the allergenic content because it can modify the protein. So that means if you have a lower content of protein, that means it's becoming less allergenic. But most of the time, the concentration of H HP, as uh, Fahmi asked, is a adjustment or is a balance that you make between you want to kill the microorganism and you want to uh, maintain the sensory quality of the food, okay? And each food are sometimes different, okay? The first, um, the first HHP, one of, no, I, I'm not saying the first, one of the famous, I think, um, HHP product is guacamole, it's a avocado paste, because the texture that is produced is just exactly what people want. So sometimes you, 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 want to balance the two. The technology has to be able to balance the two, okay? I hope I answer the question of Fahmi. Right, I think it's uh, answered really, really great and deep, Professor. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have next question from Rosbel Malo. Uh, she asked, will HPP, does, uh, is there any effect from, of the, from the quality of the product especially the micronutrient cause of HPP? Um, I don't think so. I think, well, I have, you have to read more of the literature. I may not be updated at all, but uh, uh, so far the concern is on the lipid, on the protein, on the macronutrient. So you will have to look at the latest publication maybe. Okay. Uh. Uh, next question is from Cindy. Uh, she asks, is it okay to, combi to, to combine biopreservation with other non-thermal or thermal technology? Yes, those are called hurdle technology. Yeah, people call it hurdle technology. Actually, it's a lot of times. For example, even in the old day, okay? In the old day, I told you about the 12D concept of sterilization. These are the thermal process needed to kill 12 a log cycle of Clostridium botulinum. And that's our, uh, for example, 121 degree for 30 minutes. But people don't want to have uh, their food to be heated that high because of, for example, the changes in the, in the um, texture, for example. So they start, for example, I add some preservatives so I can lower down the, lower down the temperature. So yes, the answer for Cindy is yes, of course you can use that. Like you use uh, electric field pulse and you add some of the hydrophobic compound. That's going to be perfect combination. You may need less of the electric uh, field and adding the uh, preservatives. That, that is 
now is kind of popular. That's called a uh, hurdle technology. Oh, so, hurdle. so you can hurdle is like you put a lot of hurdle. So you put S, <laughs> you put uh, uh, what is uh, uh, other technology, and then you probably store it at the refrigeration. That's also another hurdle. Okay? <laughs> so uh, more than two step of preservation. Sure. Yeah, you can do that. So we have next question from Anissa. Um, she's telling a story. Hmm. She have a experience in a way of eating sashimi of salmon that have spread out. Uh, by lemon juice but after she is eating the sashimi she always get typhoid oh, no. fever symptoms <laughs> does it a kind of our body to warning uh, if there is a microbial inside of the flesh uh, and how long it takes to inactivate the microbial by using organic acid mm -hmm. okay oh well are you really sick of typhoid or you just got uh, I don't know, uh, because typhoid fever is very, very uh, severe symptom in which you got uh, fever and then uh, the bacteria actually uh, cross your intestine and go all the way to your uh, bloodstream. That's, what, that's why sometimes it's becoming fatal. So I hope it's not really typhoid. So here it is. So like I told you before, this is a, when I want to eat uh, raw food, I want to be sure that they do not have the pathogen I want. So that's why, uh, like I mentioned before, there's many studies like putting acid in the icing, for example, sometimes when they ice the, uh, the fish, they put some uh, acidic acid. So lemon juice probably rich on acidic acid. Uh, so it depends if your fish is heavily contaminated so that's the factor is always the initial. What is the initial? That's why I said, if you want to have, for example, prolonged self-life, the first thing you want to do is do it hygienically. You have to be sure that your raw material does not have high load of microorganism because acid, et cetera, so only sterile commercial, uh, sterile commercial uh, process that will be able to knock down a lot of 12, lock cycle of microorganisms. Other process will not. So you have to be sure that your initial load is uh, not too high. So as all for sashimi, yeah, sashimi, you don't want to eat sashimi coke, of course. So you want to be sure, yeah, there's not sashimi anymore. So if you want to eat sashimi, um, if I were going to a restaurant, I would watch the restaurant. I want to make sure I'm not, I won't be able to eat even sushi from the to be honest, from the stall that is open, you know, like in my complex people uh, and we can open a, a table and sell sashimi. There's no way I can eat that because I know they don't have a good control. Okay, The controlling of the sashimi is the temperature, the low uh, initial calm, and then yes, lemon or acidic acid can do as, as far as how much. Well, again, it all depends on how much you have. If you have too much of a high, uh, microbial count, then it should actually not be used to make sashimi. That's my suggestion. You should not be making or eating sashimi with a high initial load because the process that, because you want to eat fresh fish, so you, want, you don't want to have um, any treatment that is harsh on the texture, but that means you require a very good quality of fish. I hope I answer you. So yes, I don't know how many you have to uh, uh, um, uh, expose it because it all depends on how big is your sashimi, etc. Okay. Uh, maybe we can see from the uh, sensory, like the color of the sashimi and something like that. Well, <laughs> personally, sometimes especially pathogen does not need a lot. Okay, so for spoilage, yes, you can see, for example, oh, if it's already soggy or is in, or um, for example, uh, uh, slimy, yeah. But for pathogen, it doesn't take much mm. to make you sick. So they might not exhibit any uh, changes in terms of um, uh, appearance. So it's a bit difficult. Okay. And we still don't have a kit for uh, direct 
detecting pathogen until now? Well, actually, there are many there? tools. Oh. Of course, there are tools, but it is too expensive, for example, if I have a restaurant <laughs> to do that. So it's better to prevent it. Yeah. Okay. We have a last question from Teres. Uh, she asks, what is your perspective about what happens previously in the news? Uh, particle sardines can good has transparent parasite exported in one of the developing country. Okay, so um, so we all know the anisakis. Those are the uh, fish worm. It's kind of common actually. Uh, it kind of uh, can be found kind of easily in certain fish because I think the host, the definitive host is a dolphin and dolphin living with all of the smaller fish. And so when we capture the fish, it, they may have a, a certain uh, a number of uh, parasites. When it is already processed, for example, this news at that time as a sardine, those are sterilized, uh, commercially sterilized. Actually, all of those things are dead. So the question is more of the aesthetical question, right? So because it will not make you sick, it's dead uh, worm. Then the question is more on the aesthetics. Uh, will you accept that or not? Because it may uh, give you trauma or may cause you feel yikes to eat something like that. And in uh, light of that, actually, Codex uh, has had, if you look, go ahead and check uh, the standard for Codex for fish, actually, they allow certain length of um, uh, parasites because they know it's very difficult to avoid it. So I think up to one, I forgot, you have to check one centimeter or something like that. Please take a look, I forgot. So again, if it is in a processed food, actually all of the parasite is dead. So they are just dead, just like the bacteria are dead. So you eat the, the, the dead bacteria. <laughs> but the question is more on the, yeah, the on the aesthetics. Is it something that make you not wanting to eat, I, it's, and then that's also a consensus in the community. You know, some some community it actually it worms, right? Yeah. So yeah. I hope I hope there is. Yeah. So I hope I answer you, Therese. Okay. Um, we have an additional question from Anissa. Uh, she asks, which is the more appropriate method besides using microwave or organic acid? in order to inactivating microbial? Okay, I, I don't, uh, I did not discuss microwave, right? Okay, so microwave is a, is a different kind of, it's a lower energy than the irradiation. It can be used for um, inactivating microorganism. The limitation of microwave is giving you uneven heating. I've been trying uh, microwaving thing at home. Sometimes have a spot that is still uh, not, uh, what do you call it? Not hot and then the other part is hot. Yeah. But it's not evenly distributed. But if it is only for use at home, then both are okay. At home, right? We, we talk about before it's more for industrial. So if it is for home, then you can choose. If uh, texture, the microwave will affect your texture. Maybe it become uh, drier, etc. So if the texture is not a problem for you, then microwave will be okay. But uh, the use of organic acid is usually only affecting the taste. So becoming sour. So if sourness is not a problem for you, then yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, both, of them, both of them are okay. Thank you, Anissa, you answered already. Is someone talking? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rati, for the lecture and the answer. I believe uh, all participants here experience a good um, uh, study. And I believe uh, they will use this uh, for their Task because we have uh, the last task, a final presentation and individual uh, paper. 
So uh, thank you very much. And uh, before I end this uh, meeting, uh, can we have a photo session? Maybe Dimas can lead this photo session. Yep, ready, ma'am. Oh, nice. Haven't seen your face before. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they are really active, but the connection is not really good. So yeah, that's why sure. they off their camera. Oh uh, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> like some part of in uh, in the Philippines, they have heavy rain, so they oh, don't have good okay. connectivity. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, already all. Uh, I have a uh, three screen in uh, my PC, and I will start with screen one. And screen one, ready? One, two, three, cheese. Okay, next. The screen two. One, two, three, cheese. Okay, the last screen. One, two, three, cheese. Okay, already, ma'am. Have done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rati. It's an honor to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rati. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And uh, for the student, don't forget to fill your attendance and also the quiz from this uh, lecture six from, Dr. Rati, uh, from Professor Rati. So uh, tomorrow, what we will have, Dimas? I think we will have group study. Uh, uh, yes, group discussion, ma'am. Yeah, for tomorrow, we will have a group discussion. Uh, we will give the info for tomorrow activity in the Telegram or maybe in email. So thank you everyone. Where's Don't the link for the attendance, ma'am? Oh, the link of attendance. Please, Dimas. Already in uh chat room. Uh, don't forget to uh copy the link before end meeting. Okay. I think uh, I will. Uh, yeah. Yes. Next, ma'am. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm saying I want to close this meeting. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to re uh, remember remembering to uh, to our participant. Uh, please uh submit the att attendance just one uh in just one time and. Don't forget to uh, quiz five and quiz six. Thank you. Who is the host? Oh, pardon me. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. See you all.